<clears throat> just let social media catch up a little bit. See if some of you guys hopefully start coming in. I think a few of you are starting to come in now. Ooh. Evening all, I can see quite a few of you coming in now. Um, Lee Ashby here, Met Across and SBA Memories. How's it going, everyone? Good evening. I'll just do my thank yous. Uh, just waiting for my guest to come on. He's just messaged me to say he's uh, downloading Chrome, the update. So uh, hopefully he'll be on in a minute. Right, I'll just do my thank yous. Uh, big thanks for the support to Simon Pardo of White Eagle Finance. They give quality financial advice for pensions, mortgages, investments, and protection. Check the website out at www.whiteeaglefinance.co.uk. You can quote myself or Motocross and Spear Memories to Simon to get free advice. So check that out. Big thanks to Lee Owen of Owen Developments. They specialise in supplying turbochargers to a global customer base covering motorsport, performance and aftermarket OEM sectors. Check the shop site out at www.owenturbos.com. And also you can check out www.owendevelopments.co.uk. Big thanks to Terry Smith, who's from Swindon. Uh, Terry Smith, paint and decorating. You can call him on 079-61537-505 for any of your painting and decorating needs in the south and the southwest. Also, big thanks to Craig Triplett of Jardine Conservatories. Check them guys out on www.jardineintelford.co.uk. I can see there's plenty of you guys. I'm not sure I can't see any. Um, not sure if any of you guys have sent any comments in yet. I haven't seen any coming up yet. It's a bit weird. Can someone send me in a comment saying hi or something? Just to make sure it's working. <laughs> Hopefully it is. Laney, you on the interview? You on the interview? There's just no comments on there yet. I just wondered if um, it's working okay. Hopefully it is. Hi, Mark. Thank you for writing a comment. Ah, there we go. Test. I think it is. It's all right. Thank you. Yo, Adam. How's it going? Thanks, Mark. Got word then. I thought it was not working. <laughs> hi, Tony. I'm not sure who that is, but hi, whoever that is. Uh, we'll all have to, uh, hi Richard, how's it going? We'll have to check out Adam, there's Adam Winslet, look, you have to check out, he's got, um, is it tomorrow Adam? You've got Cole Fogarty on. Evening Phil. Thank you very much Richard. How's it going, evening all? Um, my guest should be on in a minute. Uh, he's just updating his Chrome, um, which you've got to do for this stream yard, so catches quite a few people out. So uh, hopefully you'll be on in a second evening or how's it going? Ah, I can see the man now. I can't hear you yet until I bring you in the screen, but you can hear everything that's going on here. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah, sweet. Right. Okay, then, people, the man is here, so I will uh, get the introduction underway. Here we go, then. Here's the video. Bring in the man, Mr. Josh Coppins. How's it going, Josh? How you go? Yeah, good, thank you. How about yourself? Not too bad. Can you hear me all good? Yep, I can. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you clearly, mate. So it's a bit of a awesome. good day for you, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yep, yep. Um, about to get the day started. Beautiful. Thanks ever so much, mate, for making the time to come on. I really appreciate it, mate. 
No problem. No problem at all. Brilliant. Uh, so then, Josh, basically, what's uh, what's the latest with you? What what have you uh, been up to lately? What's been going on? Um, oh, my, obviously, uh, life back in New Zealand's um, a little bit different than uh, than what it was when I was in Europe and in the UK. Um, I'm now a motorsport manager for Yamaha Motor New Zealand. So that means basically handle all Yamaha's racing activities in New Zealand, um, take care of a junior program and with Ben Townley as he's running that for us. So he runs our junior program, uh, Tenere Tours and um, our demo space. So I work with Ben on that. And then we have a coaching space with a guy called Reese Carter. Uh, he handles all our coaching activities. And then we have uh, different um, aspects of racing, such as uh, the motocross, which is handled under Josh Gobbins Racing, which I still control. Um, we had a have a road racing sector, uh, which I work with the crew chief, and we have an enduro sector, which is run by a guy called Paul Wibley, and uh, he handles that for us. And take uh, work with Yamaha a little bit on some marketing activities, um, adventure bike space, um, and yeah, also do some product development for for YMC Yamaha Motor Corporation. So that pretty much keeps me busy post uh, my racing career. I was going to say, it sounds like you've been quite busy then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot going on. So as it started, um, when I when I retired from racing, it started just as Josh Gobbins Racing, which just handled the motocross team. Um, and then I quickly realised that uh, just a motocross team wasn't going to make it work um, financially and especially in a small country like New Zealand. So in order to make it work, we needed to branch out and and start to work in different areas um, and in the total motorcycle space for Yamaha to make it make it feasible for, for longevity, really. So um, quickly changed tact and moved away. Obviously, racing's, you know, that's what we're doing this interview for racing is um, yeah. in, in my heart and it's where it all started and it's what I'm passionate about. But of course, um, yeah, you've got to pay the bills as well. So um, we had to diversify a little bit. Have you been enjoying all that side of things about the racing? <laughs> Uh, I enjoy different aspects. Um, you know, it's it's just like any job. There's good things, there's bad things. Um, spend a lot more time in the office, a lot more time in meetings. Um, you know, I'm I'm a little bit more uh, with my wife. We're a little bit more focused on budgets, um, product planning, um, bike allocation, parts orders. So there's certain aspects which I, I don't enjoy, but there are probably, believe it or not, I'm sort of. The racing isn't my favourite anymore. The, what, what's probably my favourite now is um, developing the motorcycle, working in the workshop and, and the testing mm -hmm. role and working with the riders sort of Monday to Friday and, and trying to get those gains with the riders and gains with the product. That's that's what I'm enjoying the most, to be honest. Okay, brilliant. Um, how young were you, Josh, when you uh, first got into a bike then and uh, what sort of bike did you have when you first started? Started on a Suzuki Suzuki JR50. Uh, I've still got that bike, and believe it or not, I started on that about uh, about three miles from where I now live um, on a on a family farm. And uh, yeah, four years old. Got my got it for my fourth birthday, and started started away like that. Just li we lived on a farm, grew up on a farm, so just started started roaring around the fields and and around my parents' farm, and, and away we went. What sort of, uh, did you have a successful youth uh, career as well? And then uh, what made you decide that you think that you could go pro, like type of thing? Um, yes and no. Um, started off, you know, with a little bit of success uh, winning locally and then South Island wide. And then when I went New Zealand wide, I struggled to to sort of adapt to the different tracks. Like back back when I was a kid, the tracks were, were very much old school, grass, natural. Um, and then when I moved to the to race in the North Island, they were much more like they are today, developed and uh you know the riders were much more comfortable in those conditions, so it took me a wee while to get used to used to those things. Um, so yeah, started off winning locally, South Island wide, but then it took a couple of years, maybe even longer, before I could win New Zealand wide, um, and then quickly moved into Australia and had some success there straight away. Uh, um, finished second in the Australian Junior Championships, and then from there I was already didn't start racing till I was eleven, which is obviously quite late in this day and age. Um, but there's no, you know, the earliest you could start racing was eight. So in New Zealand at that time. So 
yeah, by the by the time I was fifteen, I was already into Australia, and then and then already into Asia and racing a lot in Asia, and then by the time I was sixteen and then seventeen, I was already on my way to Europe. So so yeah, not not that successful as a junior. I think I won a couple of titles, New Zealand titles. So it was about sixteen, seventeen when you thought I can actually do this as a pro career type of. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know I could do it. <laughs> just um, went for it. it just was, went for it. Well, yeah, it was a bit of a dream. Um, so I, oh. I left left school when I was fifteen and um, mm-hmm. and worked for a year in a motorbike shop, which was actually in hindsight one of the best things I ever did. It gave me a real grounding and understanding for life and 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 savings and and um, work ethic. And then I got to a point I started to crash a lot and have a lot of injuries because I was working, you know, I was working sort of nine, nine, ten hours a day, but I was still trying to train. And then I was traveling all week, every weekend to race. And and it, it just came a point where I was either had to had to make it work or or, or just be a local racer. And, and there was a de- decisive point there. And I was fairly confident, but um, obviously also quite anxious. And I just gave it a shot but at that point I was able to start earning I wouldn't call it a living but it'll be close to a living racing in Asia racing in Indonesia and Thailand and it wasn't great racing I wasn't great tracks or wasn't really helping my riding career but it was paying the bills and and it was um enough to sort of give me that step up into a so-called professional career so at a young age to go there and then go to Europe it must have been quite a culture change for you in general yeah, it was pretty hard. Um, so I came, I think I came when I was, I uh, came over when I was 17 and um, started off by leasing bikes, which was a huge financial investment from my family. Um, but at that point, there was no internet. Um, there was the Europe wasn't looking for riders outside of Europe. There was enough growth within your market. Uh, so if you wanted to come over and be successful, you had to come and prove yourself. You know, New Zealand titles didn't mean anything. Um, they didn't, you know, they had enough enough talent locally. So, and there was no, at that point, there was no development teams. There was factory or privateer via a dealer pretty much. You know, there was, there was no no real development teams like there are today. So yeah. um, coming over on my own, at 17 you know we waited up and and looked at what it was going to cost to lease into a semi into a factory team and get old bikes and old parts and then we waited up to go to a dealership and buy it and buy a truck and put it all together and it was costs were actually going to be fairly similar um because i had zero support so we Mm. decided to go for the sort of um, buy into a team situation just because i was able to get a lot more support I was on my own and and I was able to train under factory guys, learn more. Um, so, yeah, we went for that option. But it was a huge investment for my family and a lot of pressure because I knew I knew how much that was costing and I knew I knew mm. it was going to it was going to be hard. So um, that's that's how Europe started. But as far as you say about a culture shock, it was massive. Yeah. You know, I'd never. <laughs> I'd never seen uh, Europeans that didn't speak English. So uh, <laughs> when I left. I landed in Brussels and I got there. I was in shorts and t-shirt and I went outside Brussels airport in February and I've never felt cold like it in my life. I was like, I remember, you know, it's strange what you remember, but I remember my face <laughs> and the cold weather. I was just like, holy hell, this is freezing. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was holy shit. I was like, and um, from that day on, it was a, it was a very tough learning process. Yeah. You did learn quite quick though. <laughs> Uh, not quick enough, you know, in this, in this day and age, um, mm-hmm. if I was to come over and do it again, definitely not quick enough. You know, now it's a different market. You have to be good. You have to be good quick, but also you have a lot more support. So I was sort of, uh, it was a tough road in the first three years I lost due to not, um, developing enough as a rider. So I was more so leaving the track thinking, do I have enough money to survive to get to the next GP? And do I have enough money to pay my rent, pay the mechanic, um, keep the wheels turning of the truck? Not at any point was I, okay, where was I good today? Why? Where was I bad today? Why? Looking, I wasn't looking at lap times. I wasn't looking at my technique. I wasn't. And I sort of treaded water for three years, more so under pressure of survival rather than improving as a rider. And I didn't go anywhere. I was much better than that. And um, like I said, if it was this day and age, I'll, I wouldn't have survived because you have to show performances quicker. And then after three years, I matured enough and started to 
slowly do better, but I was a lot, I was a pretty slow process, to be honest. I was uh, just looking at some coverage the other day because all the old older coverage keeps coming up on uh, Motor Vision and YouTube and all that. And uh, I know one what you're I keep say. seeing all the time, you know what I'm going to say, don't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Roggenberg 2000. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. So what happened that day was basically mm. too much confidence. Um, mm. You know, co- confidence is a very, very good thing. But uh, mm. so at, what had happened that year is I I was finishing my career with Suzuki on that day. Yeah. Pretty much, I told Sylvain Gabors I was no longer going to be there, and um, I'd never won a GP, and I was sitting fourth in the championship. Uh, Pichon, my teammate, was hurt. Um, I think the championship was over between him and Bolle and I could get third in the championship which was a good payday for me my first podium in a world championship so uh, as far as I was concerned I was going there to win and it was my time and uh, I had pole position but I felt like I could uh, I felt like that I could go a little bit faster and uh, obviously too confident and made a mistake and yeah it's it's, it's, uh, pretty famous on YouTube Mm, it's very famous (laughs) Yeah, quite a few yeah, people have yeah. mentioned it to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably. Uh, I wish I was famous for for, for other things, but unfortunately, <laughs> that that seems to be my most uh, famous uh, or most popular uh, YouTube moment. That's right. I've seen Jamie Dobbs one on there quite a bit as well on the back in the British Championship. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think probably probably anyone that's had a fairly long professional career has got a bad accident. Um, just unfortunate yeah, that mine was caught on camera. Exactly that, exactly that. What sort of riders did you uh, look up to uh, and idolise when you were young then, Josh? Uh, did you have the magazines uh, over there and, you know, get all the glossy magazines out? Or Nah, not really. You know, we lived a pretty pretty remote life here in New Zealand. Um, yep. I live rur- very rural and, um, yeah, I didn't know anything about GPs. Um, I didn't know any of the riders. Um and you know i knew a little bit about america i i'd watch that a little bit um or not watch it but i'd i'd get the i'd get the uh, magazines um so from america but we didn't get anything didn't get dbr or anything like that so uh, right. i didn't know i didn't i didn't know who dave thorpe was i didn't know yeah. i didn't know anyone you know um any of the big british writers i didn't have a clue who they were so um really came in i knew i i had a dream that i wanted to be world champion and i knew that I had to go to Europe for that, so mm-hmm. that was that was why I came to Europe. And um, but I followed America a lot closer than I followed. Well, I didn't really follow Europe at all, to be honest. Um, mm-hmm. Who did do, I look up to? Like, um, yeah, uh, probably once once I got to Europe, um, Greg Albertine. I looked up to him mm. um, because he was leaving as I got there, but he came in from South Africa, and and I, you know, I sort of. He, Spoke, always spoke to me it was real polite and friendly and um really liked his attitude and how he was as a person and then obviously I looked up to him because he came from you know South Africa and was successful in Europe and then of course went on to be successful in America so um he, he was probably the one I looked up to the most who were the American guys that you liked um uh Bradshaw um you know the the fox guys back in the back in those times so bradshaw and matasevich and really liked really liked that um and then i had the the jeff stanton replica ro helmet as a kid so um he i wasn't such a big fan of him i liked the helmet so um yeah, yeah and 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 jean michel bale um i just he i just liked his style but also um his gear was always a bit different he was wearing that rs taishi uh, from Japan and just yeah, just looked different and um, yeah so and I as a kid I went to motocross the nations um, in Manjima in Australia in oh, 90 yeah. uh, might have been I can't remember what year it was now and I rode the 80 cc race actually won it and oh. um, Bale that was Bale's last ever motocross and um, I watched him there he smoked everyone in the first race and then just was over it in the second race and pulled out and uh, actually got Jamie Dobbs' signature there, believe it or not. Uh, yeah, I didn't even know who Jamie Dobb was, but he was hanging around. So I uh, thought, oh, I'll get this fella's signature. And yeah, so um, yeah, that was my first experience of uh, GP riders. Wow. All uh, right, I'm just having a look at a couple of the guys who put some questions down. I uh, got Peter Jeffrey here on Facebook's put, uh, what does Josh think about the two strokes coming back? 
Or does he prefer um, the horrible force with strokers? <laughs> yeah, so to to be honest, part of my part of my development role at Yamaha, um, probably, and he's not going to want to hear this, is uh, <laughs> yeah. looking looking a little bit further ahead at electric. Um, yes. You know, I, I I like two strokes. Um, I, I I'm actually about to test a, do some testing on a YZ125 today. Uh, it's a big part of our program here, a development program through 65, 85, and 125. I, I like the bikes. Uh, I like riding them. Uh, I understand that um, a lot of people would like to see them come back. Uh, I'm happy that Yamaha keep making them. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure we're going to see much more of them. I think probably probably we would see more electric in the future rather than more, more two-stroke development. However... Every time I sit in an office with anyone of any importance at Yamaha, I really am pushing for um, more development around it. Um, it's important for us and as as um, as a development program for those young riders coming up. So, so yeah, sorry. To, um, I like the four strokes. I like them all. I like them all. And and if we talk about electric, um, you know, hey, I'm not actually really that much of a fan of them, but I see a place mm. for them, and I and, and and unfortunately, it is what it is. So. So yeah, with all that, the environmental cool. stuff and people losing tracks and noise and all this sort of stuff is it's going yeah, that way. So, isn't it? Yeah, so my son, um, my son lives in the UK and and um, I was over there before COVID and with him and we came home from school and he's got an electric bike and he was at his grandparents and he was right and he was riding in the forest and you know there's just no way he could do that on a normal motorbike and I was like, man. I want one of these. I want to ride with them. I want to ride. So it, it, it just enabled me to, it would have enabled me to be able to ride when I couldn't have normally ridden. And and that accessibility, I mean, I just want to ride motorbikes. You know, I'm a motorcycle fan, whether it's two-stroke, four-stroke or electric. And, and hey, I do have my favorites like like uh, Peter does. But, um, but yeah, if it means I can ride, it means it can make it easier. I'm all for it. Yep, cool. Uh, got David K here. He's put. Uh, what would have been your favourite track when you were riding in the MXGP? Uh, Isle of Wight. Um, won my first GP there, and um, is it is it Johnny Hamilton? Is that his name? I think the track yeah, builder guy. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Johnny Lewis. Hamilton. Any of his tracks, like he just mm. he just could build a track that flowed and and jumped well, and and um, he built the Isle of Wight, and that was my favorite track and actually built a lot of good tracks in the uk and and to this day a lot of my favorite tracks are in the uk i really enjoyed matchams park i really like um desert martin and um isle of white as well but isle of white if i have to name one i don't ever know what knew what happened to that then he did like a couple of gps there didn't they in a british championship i think i'm not sure sure what happened yep. with the isle of white mm. yeah i rode all three of them and uh track mm. was really really cool uh, i like going mm. there it was a nice nice part of the uk this is a nice one. There's uh, Alfie here, who's from who runs the Desert Martin. He's put Ash Josh would be minds ripping up Desert Martin. What a show he put on! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, yep. Yeah, um, one of my favourite tracks, as I just mentioned. Um, really enjoyed going up there. Um, just enjoyed the technicality of the track and and the roughness of how it gets. I followed them it, on it? social. Yeah, that was it. Follow them on social media um and get quite jealous um follow johnny ray on social media and see him often putting up stuff about tessa martin so um yeah very very cool track and and a really nice part of the world enjoyed going up there and um wish i'd spent some time to um see a little bit more of of the uk it reminded me a little bit of new zealand how green it was and the flowing hills and the forest and whatnot really enjoyed it there you had some big battles there with everts as well didn't you i'm sure this is one of them here i'm sure it's 2006. Um, mm. I, I started the season injured. I hurt my shoulder one week before the start of the GPs, and I was in really, really good form. And in my eyes, um, I thought I was going to go for the championship that year and really push Stefan. Uh, whether I would have or not, <laughs> another story. But uh, of course, I came in pretty confident um, and, and hurt my shoulder uh, uh, one a Wednesday before the first round, which was at Zolder. And ended up have, having to have shoulder construct, uh, reconstruction. And um, I was out for three months and just watched the GPs every weekend and, and on TV. And um, 
I just got sick of watching Stefan win, and um, he, you know, that's no disrespect to Stefan. He was an amazing yeah. rider, as we all as we all know, one of yeah. one of one of the best, if not the best. So, um, but of course, like any racer, you want to win, you want to beat, you want to beat him. So, uh, just got really focused on trying to finish his perfect season um and, and again I don't mean that in a bad way it was it was really I just I just wanted to see uh, closer racing and um so really put a lot of focus into coming back came back quicker than I expected actually came back at uh, uh Madley Basin was my first GP and then back in 2006 and then chipped away and and then finally managed to beat him at uh at Desert Martin which which I'm sure he's still pretty gutted about. He has a lot of titles. He has a lot of a uh, lot of sort of amazing um, statistics, but but the perfect perfect season's not one of them. So uh, no. yeah, happy to take that. I got a bit of a funny story about that. Actually, I won. Yeah, I won. I won on the Sunday, and then that was uh, when the Ken Hall Trophy was still on, and I used to oh, yeah, used to yeah. race. I used to race that every year, and I flew flew back that night to to Gatwick and then raced uh, at the Ken, Ken Hall the next day and after the first race I was asleep in the motorhome I was pretty tired after obviously the day before and and um, I came out to sign some autographs or something and the guy said oh how'd you go at the GP yesterday and it was always a really strange crowd at that race it was like it was like that that was their only race for the year almost a lot of those fans so they didn't seem to know much outside the Ken Hall and a lot of them would sort of I had fans say, "Oh, you've travelled all the way from New Zealand for this race," and I'm like, "Well, nah, not really, but it's you know, sort of they just they just <laughs> didn't sort of really didn't. Get it, yeah. Nah, they didn't really get it. A lot of them. And anyway, this one guy got it, and he's like, "Oh, did you race at GP yesterday?" And I go, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." He goes, "Oh, how did you go?" I said, "Oh, I won." And he goes, "Oh, was Stefan not there?" And I was like, "What? Of course he was there. I beat him." <laughs> and uh, oh, I remember, I remember, I was so pissed because you know I was quite proud of myself. For, for beating yeah. him and this guy was like oh was he not there and I was like man <laughs> <laughs> I've actually just had someone come up this must be a rider but obviously not registered to come on so as they put what did Josh think of the La- Langrish track Ken Hall one race we came off on the first bend together after the second bend never saw him again so I'm not sure who that um, is I'll have to come back on and ask yeah, uh, I really liked it. Um, it was it was kind of like the original GP tracks, like rock hard, very technical. Um, the sidecars were there as well, which was actually about the only time all year I got to see sidecars, which I, I enjoyed watching. So, um, yeah, yeah, it was a cool event. I enjoyed it um, and, and very technical track. The start was always super tricky because it was rock hard in the first couple of turns. As as came together with this this guy, so um, yeah, it was it was cool. Really enjoyed it. Enjoyed going there, and, and um, I think I went five or six times. So I went there quite a lot. Hopefully, I'll come back on and say who it was. Uh, Gareth Edwards here has put who was the most impressive rider you raced against? Uh, what was it like lining up beside some of your motocross heroes of yours? Yeah, um, yeah, I raced a lot. A lot of good riders. Mm. Um, did a lot of racing. So. Um, yeah, I could name a lot, but obviously Evitz already mentioned him. Just his technique and and the way he could ride the motorcycle was was so effortless. Um, so Stefan, Stefan, from that point of view, um, Pichon, Pichon, how he could maximise the lap and get a really, you know, and a lot of French riders are good at this at, at really making that that lap time count and um, what it, the way he would um, be you know, make that work. That was, he was very impressive. Um, obviously Carmichael, although every time I raced him, he was not often at his best um, due to motocross the nations and weather or whatever it may be, but um, sometimes he was. So, you know, that was, it was cool. Um, yeah, I guess that's, 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 I raced a lot, a lot of good people. Um, as far as people lining up people that I looked, looked up to, mm-hmm. I, d- I didn't really, I, I didn't. I was. I wasn't really a motocross fan. I, I know that's. I know that's strange, but I didn't know enough about those people when I first got to Europe, and I was just mm. turn up and and um, I just race, and I didn't know them, and I didn't sort of look up to them, or didn't really have any expectations apart from I wanted to be world champion, and so it wasn't until I got a few years into the GPs that I started to respect those riders. Um, Manik Bervorts was one that I really respected because he did he really helped me. I did a lot of training with him 
um, were going to do it as well because I was sort of under them at, at the Suzuki team. So I le- learned so much from them. So I respected them for a different reason, not not so much because of their ability or results, but just as people. Um, mm. So yeah, so so that that's a number a number of riders, and then and then I respected a lot of the guys um, out of the UK that were doing British championships and GPs, um, Mark Eastwood and and Justin Morris and mm. and um, Robbie Hearing and a lot of those guys because I could I, I enjoyed talking with them and and um, you know at the GPs because it was you know it's a long time in Europe just speaking with Belgians and it was pretty cool to talk to them so I, I, I respected all of them but um just in different ways friendship or ability or speed or technique and yeah okay cool I got uh Richard Myrams here he's put hi Josh uh you are my favorite rider of all time and I feel privileged to have met you glad you are still involved in the sport nice one. Oh, thank you very much Richard um that's pretty pretty strange you know I haven't been retired what's coming up coming up 10, 10 years so um from from professional racing obviously I still ride but um yeah, yeah. yeah so it seems like another another life to be honest um <laughs> yes there's the, there's racing life and then there's and then there's what I do now so uh yeah. it's it's a little bit sometimes it's a little bit um surreal to hear people say that but uh thanks mm-hmm. very much Richard appreciate your support yeah, nice one there. Uh, Adam Winslet, who does the uh, Farley Castle interviews and everything with Dave King, okay. but uh, what's what's the development on the infrastructure to charge the electric bikes? Yeah, so um, I I don't have a lot to do with the electric side of things. So and and mm-hmm. I can only talk about Yamaha. I don't know about the other brands, obviously. Um, recently, you might have read that KDM, Honda, Yamaha, and uh, the Piaggio Group have agreed terms to work on development of the batteries together and, and uh, bring together their resources to try to improve that so that's mm-hmm. that's massive massive for that mm-hmm. part of it so but uh, within Yamaha there's a there's several groups and and I'm not I, I have no understanding and no idea of what is happening in the electric space my my testing role is with uh, current production motorcycles so and I'm mostly working on wr450 wr250 fx450 fx250 because um and and the reason that is is because australia sell the most um off-road motors when i say off-road i mean enduro wrs in the world more than more than europe and more than america so that means that my my job role of Australasia test rider means that uh, I'm involved in that space because that particular motorcycle is really important for our market so um, what I'm saying is I don't know I'm not involved with that <laughs> sector and there's yeah. there's there's quite a few different sectors where as you can imagine they're working so far ahead in that space yeah. so that I'm, I'm, I'm more involved in what you'll see next year and the year after and the year after that yeah okay fair enough uh, cool. Um, I got uh, David Campbell, the Scottish motocross guy. He's put, uh, yep. "Hi JC, you probably not remember this, but it was the first time I met you uh, when you were at Suzuki and we were at Lomau, Lomo, wasn't it? Sorry, Lomo. Yep. Yeah, practicing, yep. and you were trying to bribe my mechanic to change your air filter in exchange for your motocross gloves." <laughs> Yeah, I don't remember that, but I remember David Campbell. Uh, obviously, had a lot to do with him in the Cass Honda days. Um, yeah, yeah. It must have been later in my career because I would have kept all my gloves earlier in the career. I would have needed them. So, um, <laughs> yeah, no, I do not remember that. But it's amazing, you know, back in that era, we were racing sometimes two or three times a week, you know, in France and and um, doing all the internationals and then GPs. And the, the amount of racing I did was huge. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it was a massive, massive, massive number of events. And there was a couple of reasons for that. One is uh, it, it paid my way. Um, you know, I was earning decent money from those races. Um, and that makes me a little bit sad of today. Um, it, it goes two ways. Like that way, I was kind of on my own, and I didn't have a lot of support. But I was able to earn money and and work my way through to the GPs. Um, and because we were leasing the equipment, I had unlimited equipment, so unlimited tires, unlimited spares. So, as I said, I was racing, you know, Tuesday night, Thursday night in France, then a GP on the weekend, and then do some beach race in south of France or a Supercross in Italy that next week, and then that next weekend I'd be back to a GP somewhere. So, excuse mm-hmm. me. So, um, 
Yeah, so what that meant was I was able to earn that money and move forward, whereas now there's those development teams which take care of your costs, but you have to improve quicker, but you're not earning that money. So there's a there's I guess it's just the new generation, but I do miss I, I do miss those times and I do think back on how how often I raced. That was a huge, huge amount. Uh, I've got Dale Evans here has put ask Josh's best battle with uh, Everts. Well, I've already covered that, so I'm of course yeah. I'm going to talk about um, uh, <laughs> Desert Martin because I won and I didn't <laughs> yeah. win many. <laughs> no. I didn't win. Me- I didn't win many of those battles, um, yeah, but I'm yeah. I'm definitely going to uh, enjoy that one. So, um, like, look with Stefan, I wish I wasn't very smart. You know, as a rider, I was. Yeah. Um, I could have been. I could have been so much better, and um, I, you know, I was probably too stubborn to learn from him. And I was my way to beat Stefan was to work harder, just work harder, work harder, train harder, train harder. And um, you know, as far as I could see, if I'm if I'm stronger, further, I'm going to be faster, I'm going to be better. So, but actually, what I really needed to work on was look at his technique, understand where he's quicker, understand why he's quicker. Um, and understand how he's so efficient on the motorcycle. But I was kind of old school and stubborn and just sort of stick to my roots. And um, <laughs> and that's and, and, and Stefan had some good advice around him. And, um, yeah, and so, so yeah, best battle would have to be for me, Desert Martin, only because I come out on top for once. <laughs> like that. Uh, someone's put here, ask Josh his opinion on Farley Castle. Uh, I think he raced there in the British Championship. Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, yeah, I, I like it. I, I raced it, and I raced the. Um, I was very close to where my kids live, and and where yeah, where I lived right. when I was in the UK. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. really, really, you should, even when I go back there now, I always cycle past it. Um, when I go back and drop the kids to school, and I've got nothing to do in the day, and I go road cycling and pass the track, and brings back some good memories. So, um, uh, I liked it cool track um i don't like it as i've raced the the veteran one and mm-hmm. and i prefer Finally. it on an yeah i prefer it on the old bike than i do on the new bike um it's a little bit too yeah. fast and easy especially out on the grass fields easy is the wrong word but uh, it's a little bit too fast for the modern bikes and this is just my opinion i preferred it on the older bikes um so yeah but I do like it. It's a cool track. Enjoyed it. Um, even enjoyed it on the Aprilia. Um, yeah, so I really enjoyed riding the Mako around it. That was that was fun. Yeah. Is there a chance that you're going to go – will you ever go back there again to do the Farley uh, Vets thing? Yeah. Yeah, so I raced the Vet Nationals here a couple of years ago, uh, last year, and um, – and we 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 had planned, or that guy, it was on a guy's farm, and and he had planned to put a team together. And obviously, I'm over there visiting the kids pretty regular, so I yeah. said, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. And um, and so the plan was to do it, but again, but um, obviously, COVID uh, changed all of that. And yeah, I haven't heard from him, so I'm unsure if he. But yeah, I, I don't mind doing it. Um, I, I enjoy it, and yeah, it's cool to get back and see friends. And obviously, as I said, I'm very close to there when i see the kids yeah cool uh ian chesterman here but evening josh uh i have always uh, thought of you as an honorary brit of course as i live not far from marshfield as well um <laughs> did you <laughs> did you enjoy racing the more as for me it was the most amazing gp i ever went to but what was it like to actually ride it yeah um i did it was actually one of my favorite tracks um a number of reasons um very very technical um, and, and the length of the track was cool because it was just almost three minutes and, uh, you know, the 40 minute race just went so fast because, you know, the other tracks that were like a minute 50, you're doing, you know, 20 laps. Whereas on that one, you're doing, you know, 12 laps, 13 laps. Mm, and, um, yeah. the race went really, really quick. It was tough. It was technical. It was challenging. It was slippery. And, um, you know, you, you sort of it just had a real cool feel to it. Um, yeah, enjoyed it. I uh, really wanted to to um, to win it. So the year that I was at my best in two thousand and seven, um, I was leading the championship comfortably, as everyone knows. And uh, mm. I had two, I had I had uh, two race meetings that I wanted to win. And at that point, um, without sounding cocky, I I was very confident. I had a very good bike, and I was in really good shape. And I could almost 
pick and choose the GPs that I wanted to win and, and make that happen. And um, Namur was one of them and Lerop was the other one. Um, they were two, just Lerop because of the, the toughness of the track mm. and Namur, Namur because it's Namur. So, <laughs> but unfortunately, unfortunately I got hurt uh, lock it the weekend before in Namur and as, as weird as it sounds I wasn't actually going to lock it to win I was going to lock it to bank away some points and uh, it was actually it was actually uh, raining in the first race and the track was real slippery and technical I, was, I didn't get a very good start so I was just kind of um, just picking my way through but um, and yeah, obviously got injured so didn't get to win it ended up on the podium there quite a few times really enjoyed riding it for the technicality of the track the length mm-hmm. of the track and uh the atmosphere you didn't you, pretty hard to beat that atmosphere it was really really yeah. cool very cool uh i got marion davis here has put what did you think of Contrillis uh motocross track first time i seen him there was on a 250 class honda two stroke yeah uh yeah i liked it very very cool i liked wales <laughs> wales um wales reminded me again of new zealand so i always felt at home when i got to go there and um had quite a few welsh fans as well and you guys are into, or the Welsh are into their rugby, so um, yeah. that was. Uh, I enjoyed, I enjoyed it. So for all for all those reasons, and I enjoyed the track. I liked the dirt. Um, I liked how it formed up, and I always was really successful there, and um, always seemed to get lost driving there for some reason. I, I still to this day. I've been there maybe four or five times, and I'd always get lost. But um, I did enjoy it. It was a cool venue, and um, yeah, really enjoyed the technicality, the ruts. Um, yeah, the whole atmosphere was 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 cool. A lot of good memories from there. Cool. Uh, ben Rumbold here, who does motocross words. He's put, uh, hi, Josh. I was at the Lamau, uh, Lomo, say Lamau again, uh, Nations in <laughs> 2012. I saw you win the B final for New Zealand in your last international ride. Was the Nations an important event for you or just another chance to blast around with the best? Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, good question, Ben. Um Obviously, we went to the B final because our, um, another one of my teammates failed noise control. So, and then our MX2 oh, guy was a little bit, a little bit weak. So, uh, yeah, we had qualified comfortably, but when he failed, failed noise control, it was B final, and then at Lommel with the B final, and then straight into the the racing, I, I was at the end of my career. So I was um, mm-hmm. beefing up slightly and not as fit as I should have been. And that was the end of it for us as a team. Uh, as far as nations goes, every nations was a little bit different for us. Um, we were we were very, very strong, or New Zealand was very, very strong when Ben Townley and myself were at the top of our mm-hmm. game. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we, we finished on the podium at quite a few times, Madeley Basin and, mm-hmm. and, and et cetera. And then as... As it went on, um, I think that Ben at that point was maybe retired or was injured or, um, and as, as time went on and we didn't have an as successful team or an as strong team, uh, I, I was still motivated because I was representing my country, but I was realistic in the result. And once you felt that winning motos at Nations and being on the podium at Nations to going to B final, it was quite hard to, uh, to yeah. keep motivate, motivated, yeah, especially yeah. especially right at the end of my career. And, um, yeah, I find it hard to accept, you know, in this now when we are, you know, 25th and 23rd and 30th when when we were on the podium not, not too long ago. So, um, yeah. so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. But, um, but yeah, I do. it wasn't just another event. It was part of representing your country. But, of mm-hmm. course, motivation got more difficult when the result was harder. Yeah, cool. Uh, no name on this one, but they put, how did the Aprilia compare to Josh's factory Yamaha? Yeah, so a lot of people um, asked me this question, and mm. the Aprilia had some really good points. Um, uh, it was it was um, not, not a bad bike at all. You know, it turned very, very well. Um, it had a lot of mid to top power. Um, they were the they were the positives. The negatives mm-hmm. were weight. It was very very heavy, especially mm-hmm. especially uh, front heavy, and had not a lot of torque off the bottom. So it was quite difficult to to ride at, at a lean angle in a rut or pick up at pick up corner speed was quite tricky. Um, but the major issue it had was the I never broke an engine. You know we had I think we finished twelfth in the 
world in 2010. We should have finished about seventh, but we had six DNFs. Um, and seventh at that time was for them was massive. You know, like yeah. I scored more. I scored more points in one moto than all my three teammates combined scored for the year. So they were that we were we were we were doing quite well, but we had six DNFs through two chain derails one radiator broke um and two two or three wire main wiring looms broke um so the engine was strong um just all those little issues you couldn't compare it to the yamaha i was coming off a very 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 good yamaha i was coming off a very good team with ronaldi yamaha um i was going into it into a brand that was kind of more focused on road racing and they had some different ideas it worked very hard it was a really cool company to ride for and i enjoyed them as a company i enjoyed the brand and um so that's the differences between the bikes um mm. it, it just wasn't ready uh for that speed um and i signed the contract in october and in january they scrapped the project so from january for that remaining year of 2010 there was no development what we had was what we have they weren't making any more dirt bikes as you can see so it was kind of just get on with what you have um mm. which i was i was fine with it didn't i mean it is what it is it was their decision they paid me really really well um a lot of people sort of said oh why why the hell are you going to go and ride the aprilia well my time was up, you know, I was done. I was over at Yamaha and Yamaha looked after me really, really well. I wanted to go home and race in Australia for Craig Dack Racing on Yamaha and then do New Zealand and Australia. I had a real clear plan mm. for life after racing and how it was going to work. So I saw that Australia and New Zealand as a stepping down from Europe um, because you're super spoiled as a factory rider in Europe. And to, I saw it as a way to sort of ease me back into life. And, mm -hmm. and into real real life but mm -hmm. um unfortunately cdr had a two had both riders on two-year deals so they couldn't fit me in and then aprilia came on with really really good money and um so i said oh, I'll, I'll take it and it was actually a fun year i enjoyed the company um i i was it is what I, if you go in there with the mindset like oh, i'm going for podiums and i want to win races and and then the bike breaks and you get really upset you're an idiot you know i was mm -hmm. i never signed that contract yeah thinking that i signed that contract thinking it's my last year i'm going to make great money i'm going to have fun i'm going to enjoy it i'm going to go to the i'm just going to um take it for what it is of course yeah. i gave 100 percent. i gave mm -hmm. I, I rode i rode as hard as i could and and um it actually turned out to be a really fun year and and a lot of people you know questioned why i do that but now you know i look at riders now that do the same for no money and i'm mm. like well you know i think it was I was actually pretty fortunate to get that opportunity. So enjoyed my time at Aprilia. Can't say anything but good things about them as a company. Really, really, um, really fun. But they were they were more road race orientated. You know, to give you an example of that, um, yeah. we raced we raced the Italian Championships and we were at Gallarate at near Malpensa Airport. And I qualified on pole position. And we had the the Aprilia boss came that day. His name was Gigi. I can't pronounce his second name, but he's now the big boss of Ducati MotoGP team. Okay. He's the guy yeah. with the eyebrows that go like that. That oh, join yeah. up. <laughs> he looks grumpy all the time. He's the guy that did the <laughs> did, did the launch control on the Ducati. Oh, right, okay. And um and uh anyway he said oh you know because I got pole position and he said oh today we win you're on pole position and I said mate if I don't get a good start it doesn't mean doesn't mean nothing you know like yeah. and he's like no no you're half a second faster and you know and he was just in his terms he was thinking road racing and I was yeah, like well yeah, mate yeah. If, if I start 10th this is, doesn't mean I'm going to win you know you still got to yeah. put everything together and that was the way they thought from the start and then yeah. I crashed I crashed tucked the front on a turn and finished fourth or something and uh came in and he says oh wrong tire choice and i'm like no nah, no nah, just dumb rider really like just made a mistake nothing wrong with the tire choice so it was it was an interesting time but uh they 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 gave it their all so um yeah so i hope that answers the differences between the ma he couldn't compare them they, they no. couldn't compare them but they very much did their, did their best um and and we had some pretty cool rides and had a lot of plastic break off a lot of a lot of bike a lot of every race some sort of plastic would break off or yeah 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 so i think i finished lommel gp with no front mud guard no front number plate no rear mud guard and one fork guard so um <laughs> but yeah it was it was it was interesting times
definitely an interesting year. Uh, yeah, I was just going to uh, show you the pictures, some pictures while I asked you about your times on Suzuki. Uh, what what were the bikes like? I know you had uh, that was when you first went in there. What was it? Yeah, like? yeah, they were good. Um, you know, it's sad to not see Suzuki involved in the Grand Prix now. You know, they were so iconic. Um, yeah. yeah, they were a good, good, good team to ride for, and um, Sylvain. To this day, um, I owe him a lot, and very thankful for what for for, for what he did for me. Um, that Sylvain Gabors, and yeah, enjoyed it. Um, I don't think when I started that they probably thought I would ever get as far as I did. Um, but yeah, no, it was um, good team, and obviously they've been very very successful, um, and and really enjoyed riding for them. It's just a shame we don't see them in the paddock anymore. Yeah, for sure. Uh, right, I just want to go back to that question there. Yeah. Um, Richard put uh, another question I had was I was really angry with Philip Arts for that dirty move on you in 2008 that took you out. Always disliked him since. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 2008 was a tough year for me. Um, so, yeah, there's a bit more to that, Richard. Um, so, first of all, obviously, 2007 didn't work out for me. I thought I was going to win the championship, and and I was so good that year. As bad as that sounds, I mean, I, I had I would I was in a really good position. So at that point, I was like, oh, I'll just win next year. You know, it was it seemed easy to me at that time. And this is again another example of maybe not having someone around me that was that had been there and done that and could have advised me. And I was in my mind, I was like, well, I was so good this year. I'm just going to win next year. No problem and I was looking pretty good. I didn't even have Philip Arts in my mind as being the champion that year. Um, and I was, I went to, the weather was really bad, and I went to Dunkirk to train, and um, I got there at 7 o'clock in the morning, and I started riding at 7.30, and it was freezing cold just to try to, I knew it was going to be busy, but I was just trying to beat that rush and, and for from a safety aspect. Mm -hmm. And I came over a jump, and there was obviously no flaggy, and there was a rider crashed in front of me, and I landed on his bike, and I stubbed my toe on his foot peg and pushed my big toe and the next toe out the end of my uh, of the skin, basically. So compound fractured um, two toes and just from the impact. And, and straight away, my foot just... I just blew up and I was like, oh, this is not good. So I rode to my mechanic and I said, I've broken my foot. I rode back to the truck and uh, took my boot off and I could all I could see was blood everywhere. And I'm like, oh, season's over. So jumped in the car and we drove to McDonald's and grabbed some ice and just iced the foot and rang Dr. Klaus in Belgium, which many of you would have heard of, um, mm. unfortunately. I had plenty of um, time with him and had him on speed dial, which is not a good thing to say. And he met me at the hospital and did surgery straight away. And um, it wasn't actually that bad. It, he just took out the couple of bone fragments and stitched it up. And I had to write. And then obviously that race that Richard's talking about was a week late, maybe maybe two. And um, so I had to race with a bigger boot and bandage on my toes. And I was kind of just in. Um, I was just kind of in survival mode at that point. And then he, he was going really good and sort of to this day, I still sort of see it as a takeout. Um, Michaela Rinaldi was a little bit nervous and I was pretty frustrated and he managed to smooth me over and, and I just sort of put it down to one of those things really. But um, yeah, I'd probably have to see it again to decide if it was how dirty it was, but um, definitely felt dirty at the time. Um, but I'm saying that, you know, that year, started off like that and then I, I started to get better once my foot got better and I actually got up I think I was leading the championship by Germany and then unfortunately my time and my time of my very best had been and gone and for whatever reason I couldn't I couldn't um I couldn't couldn't get that back and and he was deserved a champion that year so um whether he wanted it more whether I wasn't whether I wasn't um in the right headspace or whether I didn't have the right things going on around me or you could probably say all the above but um 
um, yeah, wasn't able to wasn't able to get that world championship, and and unfortunately, Richard, I think we're going to have to um, just let that one be got, be done with. And and um, he, in, the, in the end, to be honest, he was a worthy champion and deserved it. He rode he rode really well that year, and that was his year. You know, he didn't have any more years like that. So um, mm. it's, re- it's really hard as a rider, um, and and you you guys that are that are avid fans will notice this you know you have a you work your way up and you have the year where everything just goes right everything falls into place and best case scenario you get the title and i mean jamie dobbs like that you know he's probably not he's probably not going to appreciate me saying this but he never come close to getting a world title again you know and um that year everything clicked and everything went right and even when he broke his collarbone he was able to get back and and um I use him as an example because all you UK fans will, will know that. And, and yeah. I was the same. I was the same. That was my year. That was when I was at my very best. And then when it doesn't go to plan, you kind of like, man, what, do I, what am I doing different? What did I do last year? And as soon as you start thinking like that, you're in trouble. As soon as you start to doubt your program, doubt anything, you're in trouble. Mm. You've got to have mm. – absolute. and the difference between those two years was, one, I was doubting – how how I was in that position and the other one I had zero doubt like you heard me say earlier I just Mm. I knew I knew I was picking what races I was going to win at and we see that now and it doesn't matter if you're going for the title or you have a good year and you finish top 10 and then you're trying to reiterate that the next year and a lot of riders have that have those issues and and that was really really hard for me getting off track a little bit but I'm just giving you a bit of a insight into yeah it's good insight yeah it's good yeah yeah, must so, have been very frustrating that time when you obviously had the big lead as well to get injured. Um, yeah, 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 it was. It was. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, so, um, well, it sort of happened over a long period and I had such a big lead and I just saw it coming mm. down. And in, a, and in my mind, I was like, it's going to, I'd only broken my shoulder blade and I'd, I was like, I can push through this. I'll be right. I'll be right. I'll be good. It's going to heal up. It's only a shoulder blade. And I had probably four or five weeks and I thought that's enough, you know. Um, but again, Dr. Klaas, when I went and saw him and I saw his face when he saw the injury and I was, and I, and I should have, I should have clicked on at that point that it was going to be serious. But again, I was super confident and I was like, no, no, I'll come back and I'll win the last few and I'll be okay. And then as time went on and that pressure built and Yamaha Europe was sending me all to all these doctors and I was in the UK at a, some, some chamber thing and I was doing everything and you know, everyone had this mirac- miraculous fix of what mm. to drink or what to take or mm. eggs for breakfast or whatever <laughs> it was. So I was doing everything. I was doing absolutely everything. And then um, as I got closer, you start to get a bit more nervous. And I actually went riding in Marshfield Thursday before um, the Donington Park, the, where the GP was. And there mm. was they were the last two GPs. And my time was up. I had to be ready. And I rode on the Thursday and it was so sore to ride. And I got back to the truck, I had to go back to my motorhome and Dr. Klaas texted me and said, did it hold? And I was like, oh shit. Like if he, if he is that worried about it mm. not holding as in not healed enough to hold. And it was so sore. It was weird. It didn't hurt just every day, but it hurt when I rode, it just really hurt. And that was one of those pains that was just sort of, you know, that was just, that was just, it just could, you couldn't block it out. It was just really, yeah. and, and when he said that, I was like, oh, I'm in the shit. This is, this yeah. isn't good. This isn't good. And in the first race, I sort of battled away to about 12th or 10th or something. And then, and then, yeah, I knew I lost the points lead and there was just no chance. So, um, yeah, that was that. And a few tears and, pretty frustrated and just sort of yeah i don't know don't know everyone everyone was sorry and and at the time i was kind of like ah oh, you know again super confident at that point like i said to you no worries i'll win next year but it didn't happen yeah frustrating on that one uh matt beagle here i know he's uh come from the uk he's in the aussie now he's put uh who's your favorite up and coming star from australia and new zealand and who would you compare your riding style to in the modern era? Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, Matt. Um, first of all, my my riding style is, is not good. Um, I don't have a good riding style. I don't have a good technique. Um, and that's something that I wish I had worked on from a younger age. Um, so to compare myself to someone wouldn't be, wouldn't be that nice. But um, 
to probably the one thing that I did have was a lot of lot of heart. Um, you know, I always gave it everything I had. Um, so yeah, I laid everything on the line and 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 gave it my all. So as far as a rider like that, um, no one no one comes to mind actually. Um, you know, I don't. Yeah, sorry, no one comes to mind. But as far as an upcoming rider from New Zealand, and and I don't like doing this because it's it's unfair to him. But um, yeah, uh, Ben Townley's son, Levi Townley's our he's our next best thing. Um, and I have I, I I have zero doubt that he is going to be our next best best rider. And, and I, I'm pretty sure Ben will not like me saying that. Um, but yeah, I. He's just got that X factor. He wants it for the right reasons. He's got good values. He's um, he's got a great technique, thanks to Ben. Um, he's hungry. He he just ticks he ticks the boxes and he ticks the right boxes. So yeah, that that's the next next star from from down under for for me from from uh, uh, New Zealand. And then obviously the Lawrence brothers in Australia or the. the everyone knows about them and what they've done but you you could you could clearly see that they were going to be successful i i didn't know jet but i was lucky enough to have a very very little bit to do with hunter and and their parents and and um we were involved with them at yamaha before he came over to europe for his first time and it was clear that they that they were going to be successful and again matt what i'll reiterate here on these things is it's not the speed that i'm talking about it's the it's the things outside of the speed. It's the values. It's the it's the it's the uh, the heart, the passion, the desire. That those those things are going to be what makes what what made the Lawrence's successful. I mean, they've got an amazing style. We all know that, but that's mm. just part of it. And and so does so does Levi. So yeah, hope that answers your question, Matt. Okay, thank you. Uh... Uh, Richard, put, that broke my heart seeing you ride round at Donington injured. You were the true champion that year. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Richard's definitely a fan, mate. Appreciate it. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was tough to accept. But, um, you know, a lot of people ask me now, you know, they still talk about that year and say, mm. you know, you were the champion or whatever. And I don't like to take that away from Steve Ramon because, you know, he he – he at the end he was he was deserved a champion you got to be there you got to be in it to win it and i wasn't um but you know people say oh you know do i do, am i upset about it or disappointed and mate i turned the page on that a long time ago like it just you know I'll probably probably miss the bonus right now but uh the rest of it um <laughs> the rest of it i mean i still finished third you know i think i i'm how crazy is that? You know, I missed six GPs, 12 motos, and still finished third in the championship. Mental, so, um, yeah. yeah, it Shows is mental. So. It was, yeah, yeah <laughs> so, so I mean, missed that, but, uh, I mean, that's just a selfish part of it. But, I mean, I've turned the page. I'm over it. Move on. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm probably more um, passionate. I'm, I'm so passionate about what I'm doing now and happy about what I'm doing now that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy and moved on. It's these fans that uh, don't let things like that go and they still remember all the small details that you guys don't remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, they As do. As you can they see. Do. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's cool. It's nice but um, yeah, yeah. yeah, it is. It is very cool. Appreciate it. Uh, I've got Richard Caddick here. He's put, hi, Josh. Uh, do you have any secrets you can share with us in regards to Yamaha with a wink? Also, what did you think of the Western Beach race? Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, sorry, Richard. Can't share anything to you about Yamaha um obviously um I'm heavily involved in the in the in a in the racing here in New Zealand and and the the program and the structure and the pathway um that that we have and i um, really proud of the market share that we're achieving and the, the results and um but but more more so the market share because um that that's a byproduct of results so really really happy with that but as far as the development side goes um, obviously, um, confidentiality there. I can't talk about what's coming or what's what's happening, so I'm sorry about that. But um, we're working hard, or they are working hard, and and they've got some great people on board, and the production bikes that are coming out are very very good. So, really really excited about the future. And as someone mentioned earlier about the two strokes, really happy to have that pathway of the two strokes for our younger generation riders, and and um, it's very important. So. Uh, as far as the Western Beach race goes, um, 
Yeah, so uh, I don't really enjoy it, to be honest. I'm not a fan. <laughs> um, just, uh, yeah, just um, I just don't enjoy it. And that's just me personally. And I've got nothing yeah. against Western. I've got nothing against uh, the beat race or the promoters or anything. He paid me well to come and do it a couple of times. Um, I did it on the Yamaha. And got second. I thought I was going to win, and um, that was the year that I think people started to fall. You know how they build up the the bridges, and I think people got stuck on them, and then they were falling yeah. off the side of them, and it was chaos. So, had about Steve Ramon won it that year. The year he beat me in the championship, actually, he just rubbed a bit of salt into the wound there. So, <laughs> um, I was coming second behind him and closing in. Um, for Yamaha and and under Steve Dixon at that time and and yeah I thought I was going to be able to get the job done and then with 45 minutes to go they red flagged it which didn't work for me because um obviously I didn't win it would have been a race I would have liked to have won but it did work for me that it was over I was quite happy it was over and then I went and did it on the Aprilia and that didn't the, the the v twin and the way the engine goes like that and then the water coming straight off the front wheel into the spark plug and i only lasted the main straight and it was all over i probably should have been a bit more uh, organized but um with that but i just assumed that it would be okay but it wasn't so no i'm not a huge fan of it i like it i like it as a vent i like the atmosphere yeah. I, I, mm-hmm. I get it but as a as a rider so zero interest, <laughs> zero interest in doing that. Actually, my yes. son wants to do it. My son, my son, yeah, he's all all about Western. So, Is he? so uh, yeah, I'm, I don't know why, but yeah, I just sort of, yeah, I'm pretty sure he'll end up doing it at some point. That'd be interesting. We'll keep mm. an eye out for that then. Uh, not sure who this is actually. There's no name on it, but they put "Hey Josh, long time no see. Hope you're good, dude. Top bloke and always so professional." So we don't have a name on that one, but someone thanks, no name. Yeah, thanks, no name. <laughs> uh, someone's mentioning here about, oh, Ian and a few of them was mentioned about, I uh, can't remember the name of the teammate at Aprilia who rode with you, and then someone's put, is it, it was Alfie Smith? Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, it was Alfie Smith. Lad yeah. from Banbury Way, and you remember him winning uh, everything in the local club meetings. Yeah, so it started off, um, yeah, it started off that uh, there were three in the team. It was myself, Julian Bill, and Manuel Prem. And then um, the satellite team was JK Racing and they had Alfie Smith. And I, I don't know what happened. I didn't really get involved in the politics, but for just turned up at a race. And Alf, oh, I think Julian Bill might have got injured and then Alfie got drafted into the team. And next minute he was my teammate. But um, yeah, yeah. So uh, that was, that was, um, I didn't see him a lot or have a lot to do with him. I was living in, I think I was living in the UK then, but for some reason I'd just see him on the races and got to know him. He seemed like a pretty good good guy, but didn't have a lot to do with him. Seems that was Mark Jones. Uh, oh, yeah. Welshman, Welshman Mark Jones that put that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Trust him not yeah. to register his name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, I've got uh, here someone mentioning about the Mike Brown Memorial. Obviously, they used to do it at uh, Marshfield. I presume in now Tom would probably do it at his own track at yeah yeah so i don't yeah. know if you're ever going to do that again or uh well i'd like to i hope the weather's better mm. last i've only done it once and it was horrible um <laughs> and yeah so you sort of you sort of forget how good you get at riding in the mud when you when you live in europe and race in europe you just kind of you're in it all the time and you just get comfortable and then obviously i'm super spoiled back here in new zealand now i've got a track at home and I only ride when it's perfect. And, um, yeah, you just sort of I tuned up to that. And I was like, I was nowhere, nowhere. It was um, very, very hard to ride. And it was sort of, you, you forget how good you get in it. But, um, yeah, cool event. Tom Brown does a great job with that and yeah. for, a, for, a, for a good reason. And, um, yeah, yeah uh, I would always try and support that if I, if I can. And um, enjoy riding Marshfield. Obviously, I've ridden that track a lot. I haven't ridden Tom's new track because I haven't been able to come back since COVID. Yeah. Uh, but mm-hmm. hopefully, I'll get back and um, spend, get to ride both those tracks again. Yeah, that'd be good. Uh, I got James Stanton just put. Uh, what was your uh, most favourite race team that you raced for? Yeah, it's an interesting, an interesting mm-hmm. one. So I enjoyed all of them. Um, I left always on good terms, um, and. Uh, I don't have one favorite. Suzuki was good, but 
that wasn't probably my favorite if I, I have to say um i went from there to honda and that was at the time when there was two honda teams that was when honda europe was based in rome before it came to to england and um they had a northern team which was cas honda and a southern team which was um I think it was Skittles Honda it was called then and it was run the workshop aspect of it was run by Corrado Maddy who now runs the Fantic two stroke stuff or right, it was him and his son and that's the team I learned the most in that's the team I learned the most about and and it's strange because that was a very basic grassroots team um but that's the team I learned the most about bike development uh riding uh, that uh, developing as a rider, the effort. I learned the most back in Belgium. It was kind of the old school era, you know, go to the gym Tuesday and Thursday and go mountain biking. And the stronger you were, you know, that was in the Joel Smets and Manny Burvalt's era, the stronger you were, the more successful mm. you were. When I got to Italy, I rode every day. I just rode and rode and rode and rode. And I got very, I really, really improved as a rider. So, that was my favorite team as far as learning and developing. And Rinaldi was very, very, well, then I went to Cass Honda. Cass Honda was a lot of fun. You know, Harry, Harry lacked what he lacked in budget and, and organization. He made up for in support. He was kind of like a father figure. He would do anything for you. You could have a laugh with him. You could, you could, you, he knew, he knew you know, how to get the best out of his riders, um, whether it be Gordon Crockard or myself or Kinder Diker. He knew what to say and he knew how to get the best out of us. So that, that was good for another reason. Really enjoyed my time there. Um, and then Rinaldi was obviously right up there, probably the best. Um, just the professionalism of the team. The bike was very, very cool. Um, and the wider, and that's why I'm still with Yamaha today and, I felt most welcome at, from a brand. Or, or at, at Honda, we were always kind of, at that point, there was no factory team like there is now. It was Roger Harvey, and you'd be like, oh, Roger, can I get a set of foot pegs? And he'd be like, oh, I don't know. don't know if Japan can do it. And, you know, whereas whereas at Yamaha, you just got it. The, you, mm. you, were part of the, you were part of the brand, and they just, you, you just had everything you needed. Um, so, that was from that aspect so if i have to break that down james i would say corrado maddie and i was only there for a year and rinaldi were my two first equal teams if i had to uh, ask you about a favorite race bike uh, uh, same thing so 2002 honda and 2007 mm -hmm. yamaha but i do want to give an outside mention to craig deck racing in australia so when i retired um, after my year at Aprilia and again Aprilia was cool it, it just wasn't on any of those levels but it was a good year um, Craig Dack racing in Australia when I when I retired and as I mentioned earlier I flew came home to New Zealand and I saw Australia New Zealand for two years as a stepping down from a professional racer to to semi-professional to real life after racing I saw it as a good stepping stone and, and a way to keep my feet on the ground and and um, I was really, really surprised with the professionalism of Craig Dack Racing in Australia, the support from the industry, you know, from from Fox, from all the partners was really, really strong. Um, and it wasn't far off a, a, a top European team. And um, I was able to earn really good money, which surprised me, um, mostly through bonus structure. Um, I didn't go there for the money. I didn't go there. I went there um, because I saw it as being the best team. And so that... I want to give them a shout out because I was really surprised with the level of racing and you saw that potentially with Billy McKenzie. He went down to Australia and he actually really enjoyed his racing time in Australia and, and I think he got the same sort of feeling of and was probably as surprised as me as, as how professional the series and the the teams were. Is that you? Is that you there like that? Let me just get that up. Yeah, yeah. That, so that's that's recently uh maybe i don't know maybe a year or two ago so um not that was that was not in australia yeah that's australia so that was uh 2011 okay, so second to last year with cda yamaha did you have any uh favorite numbers in general 
that you would have liked mm. that you really nah I, I ended up with six um but mm. it um doesn't i don't i don't have any favorite numbers really I, I like the look of the two on the honda of course number one looked good when i raced british championship and that number one's always going to look good um but nah no real favorite numbers no real superstitions no nothing there really just um nah no, nah, I didn't really. Sorry. That's all right. Did you have any favourite race gear over your riding career as well? Uh, I liked. Um, I liked the. I liked the Alpine Star, the yellow stuff which you put up earlier from Desert Martin. Yeah. yeah. I had had that was an, it was the cheaper line, but it had I had some kind of like trans um, uh, transponders type look and sort of cartoon type look on it that I quite like that um I liked I liked that time with Alpine Stars because I could change up the colors all the time one thing I didn't like at uh Yamaha was I always had to wear blue so that was but you know I got that like I think two races a year I was able to change it up to different colors but that was that was a bit frustrating but Thor as a company were really good to me Alpine Stars were really good to me and then I finished with Fox and I still with Fox today and and I really like their their gear as well so um but one one set was probably that yellow I've got it framed in my workshop um that yellow Alpine Star set I really liked yeah it was nice um did you enjoy doing the British Championship yeah I did yeah yeah I did I did enjoy it actually um it was tough because at that time I think we had about 16 GPs and eight British championships so that took us to 24 racing weekends mm -hmm. and then you got to remember you know we could have been in Japan one weekend and then at Land Drake the week later so and then I lived in Belgium so the commute um was a bit tricky and then um um so from a from a logistic sense um but obviously i had a lot of fans in the uk i really like coming back there and 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 felt like i was a little bit closer to home and to my roots and speaking english a bit more comfortably and go to the normal supermarket and um <laughs> so yeah yeah i did um i did enjoy it and i enjoyed the tracks you know you had a really good diverse range of tracks and and good tracks uh and, and I thought the series was was quite strong. And at that point, um, it's not quite the case now. Obviously, times have changed. But at that point, you had Cass Honda, um, MJ Church Kawasaki, Dixon, uh, RWJ, um, KDM UK, as in Roger McGee. He might have been Honda back then as well. Um, so you had all these teams that were doing GPs and and motocross and MXGPs. So it was quite a good group and. Quite and um, quite good camaraderie, and also um, Paul Cooper on that team with uh, on the SoCal team or whatever it was. So they were all yeah, um, multi tech. Sorry. Um, so yeah, it was it was yeah yeah it was really cool. So it was a competitive series where you know you could be racing the British Championship with with guys that were on the podium in GPs uh, MX2. You know MX2 around that 04 to 07 era with Stephen Sword and myself. Yeah. It was um. It was really, really, really strong. So, um, yeah, I did enjoy it. Uh, it was hard logistically. I enjoyed the tracks, but um, and yeah, I managed to win a couple of titles. So that was that was pretty cool too. Nice. Uh, did you like Fox Hill? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, I raced there a lot. Uh, I raced the motor, the famous motocross the nations in the mud, and <laughs> I raced um, my, all the GPs in the in the mid to late nineties there. Did a couple of British championships there. Didn't really enjoy the British championships as much. Uh, whether I was getting fussier with the track, or whether the track was getting a bit more burnt out, or whether it wasn't as prepped as well, I don't know. But um, or or whether in my mind I also had a um probably a, a feeling of the gp and how um how you know the atmosphere from the gp and then the atmosphere from the british championship wasn't quite quite the same but um mm. of course but but i did enjoy it it was cool um cool cool venue and i uh, like the big jumps off the hills and high speed and yeah fun track good, good. Uh, they're all taking the mic because that's my hometown, Swindon. So I always mention the Fox Hill. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. even said, yeah. like, "I'm surprised you went asked," and I literally did before he mentioned it. So, yeah, got yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Andrew Spender put, "I cannot believe I just heard Josh Coppins saying his riding style was bad. You were brilliant, mate." Yeah. So when I talk about riding style, I'm talking about actual techniques. So very techniques. Um, yeah, very being very specific. Yeah. You know, foot position. My feet were 
toes were pointing out, toes should have been pointing in, didn't grip the bike tight enough with my knees, my knees were out. Um, um, genetically, I have a bad posture for riding a motorcycle. So that that went on and, and unfortunately, so does my son. Um, but um, yeah, what I, ma- I made up for the bad technique and effort, I guess, and just desire and passion and really trying to make it make it work and push through it. Um, so yeah, that's sort of more so what I mean. Not, uh, uh, <laughs> not yeah. He's a good rider. Uh, who does Josh think are the up and coming riders from the UK? Yeah, so I don't, I don't see enough to comment mm. on that. Um, I don't get to enough events. Um, I don't follow it close enough, uh, and I don't even know some of the riders. Like, um, I follow a lot of social media and always look at that from what we're trying to achieve here with Yamaha and JCR and a brand and development and progression as a as a as a brand and a team. So um, I follow the thought on the team and uh i don't i don't know their mx2 rider i haven't heard of him and obviously he's good but i don't know him um so it's hard for me to comment when i don't know those sorts of riders i'm being disengaged from that market and i don't i don't have any desire to go to those events um actual events in the uk that i have been to and and that's not because they're not good events that's just because i'm busy but um uh the events i have been into in the uk is real basic events with my son so um southwest i don't i don't even know what they're called but i just go along with him um and yeah so that's obviously quite far removed from the next uh next top kids coming out of the uk but uh i really hope that you do have a lot of good kids and you know um obviously conrad muse is is doing pretty well um i think we'd all like to see him doing a little bit better and he's got Mm. he's got um massive massive amount of talent um and if he can if he can work out those other things which i keep talking about the desire the passion and the want um i think he can be very successful as well yeah uh, we're obviously hoping Watson to do well, but obviously he's got to go out oh, and yeah. to the next one. So hopefully yep. he'll have a couple of years there and get himself into yeah. it. Yeah. So when I talked <laughs> earlier about guys coming off good years and then mm. have an expectation, I would say last year in MX2, his expectation was to go for the championship and it didn't work. And I would say that's a year where he was probably questioning why and started to doubt himself. And then it became very, very difficult until the mid part of the season to the late part of the season. And I follow him closely because he's Yamaha. So Mm -hmm. um, in the late part of the season, when he sort of got to the point where he just started to relax and forget about it and got over it and started to show his true form. I personally think he's going to have a good year this year. That class is very, 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 very hard. So, you know, I, I don't think he's going in thinking it's going to be easy but what I think where I think he will be successful in excel is that first year the pressure's kind of off and we saw that with Raymond Favre when he won um and we sit and we saw it with uh Geyser um and guys that go in that uh, the pressure's a little bit off that they can um kind of just uh, you know the wins the pressure to win isn't there like it was for him in mx2 the pressure to develop and learn is there and and i think it'll be a good year for him he's on a really really good team he's got good teammates team looks like it's got a really good vibe to it um so yeah interested to see what what he can do and also follow his brother pretty closely with what he's doing from enduro back to motocross and beat racing and all that stuff so um you have a lot of uh good riders in the uk and and a lot taking different roads um, and it's good to good to follow that's for sure uh got um <laughs> andy obviously has put hi josh from the western gorilla <laughs> <laughs> yeah you always just dress up in the gorilla outfit and be on a quad uh, down at uh, oh right western. yeah 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 Probably yeah no, i remember that now either. oh you do remember no. oh, yeah yeah i have been back to watch <laughs> western i went back went back a couple of times to watch it but um yeah, as I said, no desire. Um, I'll let the Western Gorilla uh, take care of that. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Brett's just come on and put, I met this legend when I first moved up and Tom took me under his wing. Uh, Gavin, that was probably down at the Motor Extreme with Tom. I would say so. I would say so. Yeah, I spend quite a lot of time there um, when I'm in Marshfield. As I said, um, you obviously take the kids to school and then normally have uh, smoke there, which turns into lunch. So, um, yeah. <laughs> 
you know, they uh, look after me really well down there when I'm when I'm in the UK. Did you say obviously you've seen uh, been to some events in the UK with your son? Um, do you get do you get there and people are like, oh shit, it's Josh Coppins? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. It's the dads. It's not the kids. Kids have got no yes, idea. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, who's that? Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, last, so it wasn't last year. Last year, obviously, I couldn't come. So um, yeah. I was, oh, I was, yeah. I was there January, January last year, just oh, before March, COVID. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. and then. Um, and the year before that, I actually went to a, a few events and I thought to myself, long days, man, you sit there all day and he does like two motos. So I'm like, yeah. I thought to myself, I, sh- I need to get a bike and ride as well because then I can do a, just just do a few motos as well and it'll be much more fun than just sitting there all day, oiling the chain and filling it up with fuel and eating hamburgers. So um, so that was my thought, but obviously I didn't go back. So um but I, but yeah, I really enjoy going. Going, he loves it. He loves, he loves, yeah. it. he loves the racing, and he's got heaps of mates there that he hangs out with and rides with, and and um, it's it's really really cool to see. Well, I'm sure most people would love to see that if they saw you back in the UK riding as well. Uh, got Stewie Harrier from Speedway, his brother uh, Lawrence Hare did the UK Speedway as well. He's put highly and Josh. Mm-hmm. Did you ever have a go at Speedway while you were over here, or watch it live? And what are your thoughts mm-hmm. on it? um never had a go i did watch it live i went to cardiff once or twice um and i went to um my ex-partner's father was used to go with him quite regularly to um the swindon one um i can't remember what they called themselves now um used to go to that yeah yeah used to go to that quite a lot and watch um really enjoyed it thought it was cool but um yeah, I love all motorsports. I love all sport, actually. I watch a lot of sport, um, but I, I've got no interest to give it a go. I'm a little bit too busy, but it's unfortunately, it's not very strong in New Zealand, But um, although years and years ago it was, but not not now. But, yeah, no, I, no to answer your question, I haven't had a go. Okay, cool. Uh, I've got uh, someone here, a bit of a fan, but let's put, hi, Josh, I'm a bit of a fan girl in here. You won at Hawkstone Park, my first experience with professional motocross. After signing a poster for me while you're riding for KS Honda, he's put I was on my wall for over a decade. I bought the same graphics when I got my first 250F. I even bought your helmet. I'm really nostalgic of that era, and it's uh, you're doing. I'm afraid your name is probably the one the most famous motocrossers. Even my mum knows of you. Glad you're doing well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, pretty cool to hear. Yeah, it's quite um, it's quite strange to hear that uh, I had that impression on on people to have the helmet and the graphics and, and the bike, but um, obviously that's marketing marketing 101, so uh, I must have done my job. But, um, yeah, thanks for the support. Really appreciate it. And as I said, it's like uh, that, that's like another life to me now, but um, I'm very thankful that I got to uh, got to do it So um, and, and, and get to the level I got to. Um, so, yeah. Is there any other sports you like watching or even doing, Josh? Yeah, I like watching rugby. I, like, I watch a lot of rugby. Okay. Um, I like uh, watch a lot of Formula One and MotoGP and superbikes. Um, obviously, I have a pretty strong involvement with road racing here in New Zealand now, so um, I watch that for a number of reasons. Um, uh, what else? What else? V8 uh, supercars in Australia. I like watching that. Um, obviously, Supercross. Watch that. It's on again tonight, I think. So looking forward yeah. to that. Um, what else? I think that's I think that, that I'm I'm actually really really busy. I don't um, if I watch TV, I tend to um, put a movie on and just switch off. I'm 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 actually pretty busy. I travel a lot in the role I'm in. I'm at events nearly every weekend, just whether it be enduro or cross country or kids junior racing or or road or or, or a marketing event. Um, pretty much yeah, due to I haven't been, had a weekend off this year yet. I have because of COVID. We had a couple of couple of lockdowns, but um, but um, other than that, um, I haven't had a weekend off this year so far. So um, yeah, so it keeps me pretty busy. So I don't don't tend to watch watch that much TV. But when I do, I, it's generally the sports channel. Uh, Gavin, you'll obviously be trying to make your way back to the UK at some point um, in, in this year with the COVID hopefully coming to an end soon. Yeah, I hope so for you guys. Um, obviously, mm. I talk to my son nearly, you know, and daughters, um, but mostly my son nearly every day. And um, 
if not every day and you know, get the update and we, we talk about Boris and we talk about um, all sorts of stuff. So, uh, yeah, well, if I, if I can get a vaccine and to come back or as soon as he actually wanted to come out here, uh, obviously when things were really bad over there, but I mean, I couldn't come and get him or, and his mum couldn't bring him out really safely. There was so many, it was so difficult. And um, I actually did, thought that it was the best and safest for him to stay there and I didn't want to bring it to them coming to pick him up or coming over so um yeah in the end in the end it, it didn't work out but um I definitely will be coming over as soon as I can and and um hopefully sooner than later as I said normally I was there every I have been there every year and normally even sometimes two two times a year um so, and he normally comes out or my daughters as well sometimes come out so so it's a pretty, uh, mm. pretty, pretty different time for us. But yeah, um, half, thank, yeah. thank, thankful for FaceTime and um, get lots of videos <laughs> of them doing stuff and 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 girls riding their horses and whatnot. That's good. That's nice. Um, someone's put. Does Josh have high hopes for his son and Arthur for their future in motocross careers? Uh, no, I don't. I don't have any hopes. Um, it's there. It's it's their their riding career. It's their um, their pathway, their passion. Um, what I do have, that's a lie. The hope I have is that number one, they enjoy it. Number two, yeah. they um, they do all the things I keep talking about and good values, uh, good work ethic, good attitude. Um, and if they can tick all those boxes, and if they are successful, that's and that's what they want to do, that's good. If, if that's what they don't want to do, that's also good. Um, yeah, probably more so to me, I would prefer successful in life rather than successful in motocross. So, um, yeah, hope that answers that question. Uh, I've got Sonny Me Harris here on YouTube, but do you follow the supercars? Which you yeah, I do. Yeah, yep. yeah, I follow it. I follow, I, I follow it much to my wife's disgust. I'll tend <laughs> to uh, watch that very closely. Um, we've got a couple of Kiwi drivers that do really, really well. And and I also watch I also watch it from a sponsorship point of view. You know, I learn I learn a lot about the um, you know, they, they do a very, very good job of the T V promotion, of the taking care of their sponsors, um, the look, the image, their media around it. So always looking and trying to learn for what we can do better um, with the JCR side here, but also the whole Yamaha side. Um, got someone mentioned, Miriam Davis said, I think you rode the rider evening meeting in Wales once. No, I didn't. I didn't. I, I'd never been there. Um, I think mm. I, so, so when I rode for, Ca yeah, it was when I rode for Cass quite often. And I think this was when Harry tended to uh, say, yeah, 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 he'll be there. But, um, I didn't often know much about it. So, uh, <laughs> I, I think that rider ev event may have been one of them. Obviously at that point through Cass, I was living in Belgium. So mm -hmm. it's a pretty big trip to, to ride yeah, it. Um, evening, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, and I had Honda Park and Lommel and very, very good training tracks at my back door. And, 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 um, so I didn't really need to be in the UK that much. So unless it fitted in, I would never plan to go, but quite often I did get people saying to me, oh, you were set in TMX, you were going to be there. But um, yeah, I can promise you, Marion, I didn't actually know anything about it. So um, um, I don't, <laughs> I've never, I, I haven't been, but I do know of the event. And um, yeah. yeah. Right, fair uh, Matt Evans, but was North Nibley the last time you rode in the England UK meeting there? Um, not not the last time I rode, but it was the last event I rode. I, I had a 450 Yamaha. I was doing some work with Courtney Duncan when she came to do WMX in Europe, and um, I had a YZ450. And um, when I was over visiting the kids, I was doing some riding at Marshfield and places, but I didn't I didn't do any races. So yes. Um, that was the last time I raced, but it wasn't the last time I rode in the UK. Um, someone's put, uh, did you ever, uh, did you never fancy switching to the tarmac like Graham Irwin did on the British Superbike? Um, nah, nah, I didn't. Um, I'm, I'm following him really closely. It's cool to watch. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Obviously, I've got a much bigger um, focus on road racing now. I'm handling, I'm involved with the budgets and whatnot for our Superbike team and, and our 
150, 300, 600 team. So um, uh, I am following it closely with him. I've got no interest to do it. Um, I tell you what I am getting into riding is adventure bike. We've got the new Tenere uh, 700 and um, Ben Townley, who I said handles our junior racing and our tours and our demos. He's got a company called 101 Adventures um, and and he's got the Tenere Top of the South Island um, Tenere Tour, which starts here from JCR in a few weeks. And um, I did the last one in April and um, in the central plateau, the central of the North Island of New Zealand. And I really, really enjoyed it. Really cool, fun. Get to ride with bike people and stop at the cafes and drink coffee and have a beer at night and and just chat about bikes and bike stuff and 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 enjoy the uh, countryside and I've, I've been really enjoying that but i did ride the tarmac once um, when i rode for Cass, we went to donington park and did a ron haslam day once it was cool okay. um mm-hmm. i obviously i handle all the bike allocations for our superbike team and parts and whatnot and um yeah when they come up for sale i always threaten my wife that i'm going to buy the r6 but to be honest, it's just a dream. I'd love, I've still got the leathers Alpine Stars gave me. They're still in their wrapper. They gave them to me oh, yeah. when I wow. when I retired in Europe, which was 2010, and I haven't worn them. So um, I, I I know if I, I I know if I get the R6, I'll never ride it. It'll just sit in my shed. I've got a motocross bike. I don't ride enough. And that, and that track's at my back door. You know, I've got to drive to yeah, the road so race track. It's just not. We had a Yamaha track day recently for customers and the Superbike team attended and they tried to get me to take my leathers along but mate, if I do it it'll be I'll be on my own it'll just be a casual day <laughs> just a bit of, yeah, just yeah. a bit of fun uh, it won't be um, but I am following Graham and I wish him all the best I'm really um, yeah 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 I feel for him it's um, it's a huge learning step and he's doing really mm. really well um, I've got us now i'm involved in that space i do have a slight understanding for what an undertaking it is um and i wish him all the best and i really do hope he's um as as successful as as his brothers yeah i've just got that picture of you there mm. yeah i've got a i do have a super motard um uh bike or i've got all the gear and occasionally i do yeah. super motard but it's not enough places to that? ride did yeah yeah. Oh. yeah yeah i did yeah, yeah, I did enjoy it. It was cool. Um, I liked it. I enjoyed it. It was fun. Um, yeah, but I'm just, I would like to have one and do more of that, but it's like everyone, you can't do everything. Yeah. That was nice there. You got a. Yeah, yeah, it was nice. Like, obviously, I'm probably one of the only riders that went through that um, era of uh, when I started GPs, there was no uh, promoter. And then um, it was pretty much run by the clubs and the FIM. And then I went into um, the action group era, which was Giuseppe when he first took over. And then Giuseppe sold out to Dorna for a, for a period. And then Dorna sold it back to Giuseppe. And then um, that started Youthstream. And I went through that era. And then um, obviously now there's a there's that swiss link um and i'm not obviously not involved in them but i went through quite a few different changes in that space and yeah it was nice of them to appreciate my efforts and likewise Very appreciate nice. what they yeah. did what they did for the sport as well uh david campbell just put josh uh should have asked you this back in the day but how did the lizard come about being on the back of your race kit i'm only asking as i have an old set you left behind you were a skinny bugger back then 32 inch waist <laughs> Yeah, I can still just slide into the 32s, David. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's a slippery slope, though. Not long to go. Um, uh, it's just a nickname that stuck with me. A few people still call call me it today. It sort of happened locally. Um, it actually happened at an after-school job, um, which I was working at a fish factory, believe it or not, um, which my father was the manager for. And, yeah, just stuck. So no real – they just – I don't know why they just called me that. And then and, um, Alpine Stars said, do you want a nickname? And that's the only one I ever really had. So that's what went on there. Okay, fair enough. Who were your biggest uh, influences in your career, Josh, would you say? Uh, so I had a local guy. Um, first of all, short answer is I didn't have enough influence, influences. Mm. Uh, I needed more. and like A role model, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I needed, mm. I, needed, I needed more. But I was, quite, I was really mm. shy. Um, and mm-hmm. I didn't, um, I didn't sort of probably 
reach out or really warm um, to that. So that, that, that's that's no one's fault. If, if anyone's fault, it's it's my fault. Um, but locally, I had a guy that helped me that had the local dealership, and he's still a very 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 good friend today. He was a Suzuki dealer, but I've now switched him over to Yamaha. So. Um, um yeah and he his name was murray and um he helped me a lot through my earlier part of my career and he's now helping me again um he was out of touch um when it came to the help at the higher end of my gp career he's more helping me with sort of grassroots stuff um but uh after that i guess i'd take it to my mechanic fabio he did a huge amount for me he was my mechanic for eight years and went from uh maddie honda to cass honda to rinaldi and he's still with yamaha europe or rinaldi now um so he he was a big big part of it um i should have listened to him more i should have i wish he had spoken up more um and then after that jackie vermont i did some work with jackie vermont and i didn't do enough i wish i'd worked with him earlier uh and what i but what i learned from him was was huge and um he was very very uh i, I use a lot of a lot of what i learned from him today still so um mm. yeah wish wish i'd wish i'd started with him earlier um and mm. other than that just my team managers you know um i wasn't super close with with um sylvain gabors i got a lot of respect for him but that's why i left the team i didn't feel like um you know wouldn't have that kind of relationship um a little bit from Corrado Medi from Michele Rinaldi I was kind of already shaped and he was sort of above me he wasn't team manager he was sort of director of the business so so yeah only a couple only a couple and I wish I'd had more mm, yeah uh someone Amex does a book career on uh, YouTube but what a GP rider uh what do you feel was your greatest achievement in motocross so uh, I feel like my achievements now, to be honest, uh, uh, are my greatest achievements. Um, and that's outside of racing. That's my management role within Yamaha. Um, you know, we, we are in New Zealand, and I, this might be quite hard for some of you. I know New Zealand's small, but um, obviously um, we're the number one off-road motorcycle sold in New Zealand. Um, we have a really good structure and pathway and plan for our riders. Um, we we have a, a blue crew system which which I modelled off the original Team Green program that used to be very very strong in the UK. Um, um, so it's a five year plan, and we're only a couple of years into it, and and we are grabbing a lot of market share. And I know if we come to the UK and we watch a race, it'll be ninety nine percent KDM on the start line. Whereas I'm my intention is to make that ninety nine percent Yamaha here. Um, and we're taking a lot of market share from 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 KDM in that space. So that's what I'm most um, proud of, and and what I think I have had the um, yeah. If you ask me, that that's what I'm most proud of at the moment. If you want to think about as a racer, um, or or for me to mention as a racer, it would be probably my work ethic and never give up attitude. Um, I always gave it everything when the start gate dropped uh always and i think that's why i probably ended up getting for a foreigner getting quite a few fans because i always tried to give fans time and always um, tried to be approachable um even on bad days um, so i think generally i had a pretty good following and and always gave it my all if you come to watch me you knew that i was going to give 100 percent. and i left all the teams that i've been with on good terms um so yeah i'd say that from a racing sense have you got any general sort of regrets as in like a uh, wish you went and rode for a certain team at a certain point or the way you did things or and no regrets yeah i got a lot <laughs> got lots um <laughs> we got lots lots i should have done better lots i should have done different but at the same time and it's more from a personal sense not from a not from a racing sense um but in saying that i mean it is what it is um I, you know, I don't like the word regrets. Uh, I did, mm. I did, I did some good things. I did some bad things. I made some bad decisions, but um, whether it was right or wrong um, at the time, I, it's, it's, it is what it is. And I mean, you just got to move on and take it on the chin. And um, but as far as 
I don't think I can change too much. You know, I, I, I made the best decisions from a, from a racing sense. I made the best decisions at the time, which I thought were best for me. Um, um, you know, I'm terrible with confrontation. So I tended to probably just um, uh, maybe not say enough at the right time or maybe just um, move on and not say why or there were definitely some things I, I should have improved with and should have been a bit more upfront about. But um, I think I think in, anyone listening to this would be in the same boat. You know, we've all we've all got things we'd make slightly different, but it is what it is and it made me who I am today and I've just got to... I think I think within reason I can hold my head pretty high and and move on and and yeah just that's about it not not too much to not too many regrets to be honest. That's good. Uh, if you could give any advice to any youngster currently racing in the youth motocross now that's uh, thinking about uh, going into the pros, what advice would you give them? Um, I would I would more so talk to the parent than the child. Um, and the parent, the advice I would give them is uh, treat your son or daughter like a business. Make business decisions. Make make them from your mind, not from your heart. Um, spend your money very, very, very wisely because you're going to need it. Um, and enjoy it. Enjoy the process. And don't overextend yourself that it's going to affect your family. Um, and make sure you enjoy it with your other siblings and your and, and your wife you know don't let it don't let it um separate the family uh that's that's probably what i'd say from a from a, a from a sort of parent side and into both parent and rider i would say be respectful uh have good values um stick to your beliefs um work hard and um yeah, be smart and make 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 re- make the best decisions you can at that time with that information, and try to have someone around you you can trust, someone that's been there and done that, that you trust. Um, try and find that person because you will need it and it will help. Um, I get asked those questions a lot, as you can tell, I've got that answer pretty worked out. Um, yeah, <laughs> I get that. I get asked that question a lot from from mm. writers from within New Zealand and. You know, often I'll be asked, "How good's my son? How good's my daughter?" And uh, my my answer is, "What's good?" Because what's good to you and what's good to me yeah. can be very, very different. So, um, yeah, just got to uh, treat that one treat that one very carefully. And but the main thing is have fun with it, enjoy it. It's it's why mm. you started it. Don't don't lose sight of that. Yeah. And um and just but and the reason I say spend your money wisely and be smart is because. And I've done this in business as as a team owner, you know, I you get sucked into what you think you need and what you, you know, just make those decisions very smartly and don't overextend yourself and, and just rein it in because um you know it's you you've got a long way to go yet and um you can make it to the top. You know, I probably sound a little bit negative, but there are a lot of positives that, you know, you can make it to the top. You can become yeah. very good. Uh, you can, even even if you have, and I, I think I'm probably an example of this. I wasn't a great rider technically, um, but, and I know times have changed, but you can be successful if you can put those things in place. And um, it, it is possible, and there is a pathway there by British championships. There is still a British teams involved in GPs. Um, you can still do it cost effectively. Um, you've just got to be really smart about the decisions you make, and and I don't think that matters. And and we are all talking about motocross, but that that doesn't matter. And that's in all sports, that's in life, and that's in business. Those decisions as well. Um, who do you enjoy watching race now, Josh? I know you said you mentioned that you watch uh, the Supercross as well. Who sort of uh, excites mm. you to watch him race now? I really like watching uh, Roxon. I like his sprint speed. I like his style on the motorcycle. Um, I really like watching Cooper Webb's um, uh, sort of bulldog kind of uh, endurance and just get it done and turn it around and, and the mind games between those two and, and how that's going. Um, I like... Uh, I only, re- I only really, because because Supercross, I can watch it at night, 
like it's it's pretty much perfect here the way it goes i can sort of like tonight's on it it'll be slightly delayed but it'll be on at like 7 p.m so it, it suits me because the gps is on at like one and four in the morning i just watch that little highlights package on youtube thing um and and you don't see a lot so and what tends to happen over time is you get a little bit disengaged with that, with the sport mm. at that level, because you, you're you not sort of seeing as much like you are with Supercross when you when I get to see the heats. And so, um, and, 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 the, and the GPs, obviously I follow all the Yamaha guys really closely. Um, Yago Getz, I know his dad really well, and I've seen him come up. He did a lot of riding with him when he was on a 50 and 65 in Honda Park. So, um, and hurlings hurlings in the sand and watching what he can do and and also watching how he goes with confidence and then how he goes with injuries and then uh as his confidence grows and and mistakes he makes and i like what and geyser like what you know like he's he's really really on the limit um mm. and tony and tony Coroli watching him as he sort of um he's out of his career and how he handles that and how close he'll be this year and um handling injuries and prado obviously the trans the transformation from a mx2 to a 450 and having the injuries he's having and then making the mistakes he's making and the decisions he makes so yeah i enjoy watching all of that i guess i'm just going to put a few of these uh, pictures up for the people uh for the fans out there that i've uh, posted up that i've got a lot on here i just i'm sure that you must have had a bit of fun with this guy <laughs> <laughs> he's a bit of a character, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got a, I got a story about him. So I got, a, I got two oh, stories. Good, yeah, and, yeah, that'd be good. And, um, and so that year, um, and that photo, that was a photo shoot at the start of the year before Valance International, and we left Italy, and he was flying home, and I said, "Man, why are you flying home? It's like way closer. Just jump in the motorhome with me, and we'll go across to, to, to do the photo shoot." He's like, "No, nah, man, I have to go home and have a sunbed." And I'm like, I, could, I couldn't believe it. He flew back to Holland, had a sunbed, so he looked good for the photos, for the photo shoot, and then drove no his way. BMW down. And then in the photo shoot, he had his Rolex up on the uh, – you know how you have those backdrops in the tents? Yeah, he yeah. Had, he, had, he had his arm up so you could see his Rolex. And then uh, I was cracking up. And then uh, when when it came out and the banners come out, they photoshopped the Rolex out of the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Did they? That's yeah and then we were testing with ferrelli once near near an Audi's, and uh, i loved it down there i love italy and i loved it down there and he didn't like it he just always wanted to go home to holland and he says um we were testing with um pirelli that's the same photo shoot and um he says uh he said to the boss i could i cannot believe this he says he was struggling and he's like i'm over it i just want a job that pays me lots of money and i don't have to work <laughs> <laughs> and uh and and the, and the, you should have seen carlo rinaldi that's michaeli's son like he was the manager of the team and he was just his jaw dropped and he was like oh man and then we got back to the workshop and and carlo said to me hey josh can you take him cycling we we're doing a recovery cycle he did about four laps for the tire testing because he was over it and uh so i said okay we're gonna go for a ride for an hour just do a spin out recovery and he goes where are we going and i said we're gonna go down towards palmer uh, Renaldi workshops just in just towards the mountains from Palmer and I said we're going to go down towards Palmer and then we're going to turn around and come back and he goes man that's more than an hour and I said no nah, an hour's an hour and he goes no nah. he said it's downhill there and it's uphill on the way back so it's more than an hour and I said what <laughs> <laughs> so in his eyes because it had, because it had some hills in it it was more than an hour oh man yeah. he was a really he was a really cool teammate because he took all the pressure off and it was all mm. fun and games and jokes and and uh, unfortunately, he thought he had a two-year deal, but it was an option for the second year, and Rinaldi got rid of him, and he, he didn't do himself any favours. And uh, then he bought a big house, paid a lot of money for this big house, and I'm like, man, why don't you buy two and rent one out for the same money as that one? He's like, nah, man, got to have the house. So he had the, had the big house, but uh, unfortunately, he doesn't have the big house anymore. So, uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> But uh, what I will say about him is I'm really proud of what he's achieving now with F and H mm. Kawasaki. Um, he's running a really good training program. Um, I message him from time to time on social media, and he is doing a very, very good job with with that with that crew. Um, no doubt he's teaching them a lot of the mistakes he made along the way. 
Um, but yeah, it's really good to see him doing so well with that team. So yeah, I'm definitely going to try and get him on. Um, he's definitely a character. <clears throat> I did get in contact with him once uh, when I did uh, quite a way back. Now I did a lot of your guys' uh, Q and A's, written ones that I got yours and yep. Ben's as well and stuff, and his. Yeah. And I spoke to yep. him and I was like, "Oh, I was really excited that I was speaking to Mark Deruva." And he was like, "Mate, we all shit the same. Don't worry about yeah. it." Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Funny. No. Yeah, that's him. Yeah, that's him. He, that's him. he is pretty a pretty really awesome. deep down and 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 alone. He's just a really really nice guy. Like he um, mm. had a lot of fun with him in the team. I wish he could have stayed on um, for a bit longer, but unfortunately. He made a few bad calls, and um, yeah, but but yeah, genuine, genuine guy, really, really cool. Mm. Nice to be around. Um, there's a nice one here. Is that you, Josh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 19. Took that one out, didn't I? 1989. It's my first new bike, KX80. Yeah. My only ever, my only ever Kawasaki. Um, obviously, must have flipped it and lost the rear mudguard. So, um, still <laughs> ride it that. Still right at that venue. Um, it's a long time, a uh, long lot different now, that venue. But, yeah, still ride there occasionally. But yeah, 89. I started at 12 and 89 as well. There's got a um, mm. uh, nice one there. Yeah, that's not me. Uh, I that's think not you. That's, nah, that's, um, that's a Yamaha photo for their... I'd say a Yamaha Europe one, but I, I don't know who it is. It's not me. I mean, it might be someone Eric Higgins, actually. Someone put your name on there as well. <laughs> yeah, I probably no, got that's not me. the number six as well. Yeah. Some, yeah, I never wore CD like boots. So uh, uh, I think it, I think it might be Eric Higgins. So, um, this one here is... This one here is from a race which um, Ben Townley promotes. It's um, oh, called yeah. SX SX4. It's uh, four. It's it's modelled modelled off Speedway for that Speedway listener. They will be excited about this. So it's four four laps, four ju- four obstacles, um, four riders, and the same point system as um, Speedway. It's a light wow. start system, and there's twelve riders, and um, you go through a a knockout program then you have semi-finals and finals um and it's a it's like a small supercross track only a little bit easier and it's been really really popular um so yeah he's it's something he's promoting and looking at making bigger and taking around certain towns and um, building it up because supercross is a little bit hard to get off the ground here so this is mm. something similar but you can do it on motocross suspension Mm, sounds very interesting. I've never heard of that one either. So that yeah, cool. yeah. Have a have a look on social media. Yeah, yeah, I'll check that out. It's it's it's, it's, uh, it's only one event a year. So um, yeah. Interesting. I love that setup as well. I love the fox gear and the fox boots. And yeah, it's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's in Valance. My first ride with I think I won that day. My first ride with Ronaldo Yamaha. Uh, motocross of nations uh, yeah i don't know don't know oh america um colorado looks like i've crashed because the clutch lever's all bent down oh yeah just about that i don't know what this was about yeah. with Everett, so oh that's uh he's not quite as happy as a smile i don't think that's uh is that the desert mountain thing was it or? that's yeah that's desert mountain yeah how oh, is it yeah yeah oh might be south africa south africa when he waved at the crowd in the last lap and went down and then i ended up winning and then he had to go for doping control and then he missed his flight and it all went pear-shaped so um uh, yeah, yeah he wasn't happy he wasn't happy that day either <laughs> like that yeah yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know where this one is. Oh five, oh five. But yeah, I'm not sure. Oh, it might have been. It might have been um, Nims, Belgium. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Got some nice ones here on the Honda. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think that's Matcham. Yeah, that is. That's at Matcham's Park, over oh, the big tabletop before you turn left and come back past the start. Nice one. I got in the back. Yeah, it's a photo shoot in uh, Johan Boonen's place in Lommel. It's funny how you can remember a lot of this stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
I don't know where that one is. Doesn't ring a bell, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. Ah, oh, Portugal, Portugal. That's a Guida. Uh, it's a Guida, yeah. That's a Guida. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crashed, crashed like two turns later, and then got run over. It wasn't a good race. Um, and then yeah, this one's Lear off, I think. Uh, um, yeah, not sure, not sure, but that's uh, oh four, oh five. Yeah, it's a book, um, bit of a, um, yeah, some sort of a book um, that was written about me. Uh, a lot of people still ask me about it today, but it's pretty embarrassing, to be honest. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know about this. Is, is it still out yes. there? Yes, uh, it was only sold in New Zealand, but I think they sold uh, sold quite a few, sorry. but um, yeah, it's a bit of a, I, I wish I'd sort of done it later when you have more stories and been a bit more open and honest uh, autobiography you know there was at that point it was sort of more about earlier in my career so oh, okay would you ever do that now because a lot of guys seem to be doing that which a lot of people uh, no. I, I wouldn't i don't think i'd sell no? enough but um but uh I yeah I, I, I wouldn't do it but um but yeah it's sort of it takes a lot of work to do it properly as well and that was the other mm-hmm. issue when i did that True. i wasn't really racing so i wasn't i was still racing and i wasn't really focused on that uh, that's yeah, not me either. That's actually Pit Byer. Jesus Christ, what's going on with my? Yeah. Oh, that's for you. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, he was my teammate then. So that's 2002, the time with Corrado Maddie. That was um, that was a good year. I, I rode really well, finished second to Pichon, and and um, I really enjoyed that year of racing. I did love um, uh, the black can. Yeah, that yeah. Nice. Uh, that's that's um, double moto win, um, GP Torchenthal. Uh, no, not double moto win. That's 2008. I took the lead off Philippartz for the championship that day. Um, but I think that's the last time I won that year in 08. Um, yeah. I enjoyed Did you like that setup? Did you like that yeah. setup? It was very cool looking. Yeah. Yeah, no, I did enjoy it. Uh, that's uh, in um, Barlin, um, August 15th, the K Oval International Race. Um, I did it because it was my home. I, I lived just down the road from the from the track, so I was deep, deep, deep sand. Obviously, don't know where that is, but it looks pretty sandy as well. It might be there as well, I thought I'd say. Mm, yeah, who knows about that one? But definitely looking pretty skinny. Uh, yeah. That's Bel. That's Bel Pooge. Uh, Guida again. Obviously, obviously inside the uh, tent. So that's 08, 07 where the bikes were blue and then we got that monster sponsorship which is still on board from 08 onwards. And that's an Aussie, uh, I think, when I won the championship in 2012. My last professional race. Uh, that's at a uh, motorsport, uh, sorry, at a farming agricultural event which... Um, it's the biggest one in New Zealand and we have a motocross section and a couple of the team riders and we did a 60th anniversary bike, a yellow one for Yamaha, uh, one off. Uh, someone just put, David White had put in the comments as well, as the only book he's ever read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of kids say that because obviously they don't tend to want to read read about um, yeah other stuff, but yeah, that, that seems to be the case a wee bit. It's working with Courtney Duncan um, in the in the GPs. So we did two and a bit years with her in WMX. Did you enjoy that as well? No, um, that's that's why we stopped doing it. Um, yeah. The main reason we did it was to we knew she was good and she mm-hmm. came right through her amateur career with Yamaha. So we wanted to yep. try to help her get into GPs. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem was it was too expensive. Um, it was much better with her on an existing team like she is with Dixon because they have no real extra costs for running her. They're going there for their MX2 rider anyway. So we had um, only costs just to run her and um, therefore it was too expensive and, and um, I'd been there and done that with the GPs and I just found myself not enjoying going to them as much in, in that aspect. Um, and we had a whole lot of programs we wanted to get started 
in New Zealand, such as what I've talked about with the junior program and the um, Blue Crew program and the development, um, 65 uh, through to 85, 105 development junior program. And we couldn't, we couldn't afford it because we were spending too much money doing this and all this money was getting spent in Europe. And so we decided that it was best for us to focus on the market that was paying for that racing and to keep the money here and develop the talent here. Um, so we created a new five year. Okay, I see, I get what you're saying now. Um, lost your, no. Is he just got a click on something, I think? <clears throat> it's probably an unmute. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, it's probably an unmute right. thing there, yeah. Battery okay. ran out. Yeah, so right. basically, basically, we decided um, to put the money into New Zealand, and and it's from a from a sales perspective, it's been a much better decision for us. Yeah. So that was my first year back in New Zealand, two thousand eleven. The the Australia New Zealand team was sponsored by Rockstar, but it only lasted about three months. Did you enjoy that once you obviously got back home and just uh, riding obviously at home then? Yeah, so it took me a long time to get used to the to the reverse engine Yamaha and switching to Dunlops because I did my whole career on Pirelli, but I was loving being home and uh, really enjoying flying from home um, to the to Australia to do the racing, fly in, fly out. Uh, actually, actually ended up earning really good money, which surprised me. Um, mm. Just cause I was getting good results and and I was able to sleep in my own bed, live in my own house, which I hadn't done for ever um yeah. and you know i had a workshop at home and a track here and really enjoyed that um that part of it uh, i was working with a young rider jay wilson he did some time with jk and he uh, recently and he raced the uk arena cross series recently um he won the mx2 title for us a few years ago he still rides for yamaha and he heads up um the Queensland coaching program for Yamaha Australia and I still still speak with him most days. Um, I'm just gonna get off that. <clears throat> I just got um someone just put you have a great outlook on racing and life in general. <laughs> oh that's good. Um yeah I feel like I've done a lot, done a lot of racing. Um and obviously um yeah very fortunate where I live here in New Zealand and and very fortunate to um, be in the job role I'm in, and I understand that, and I'm I'm enjoying it. I'm, um, yeah, pretty. Oh, I think I was very, very optimistic, thinking that uh, I could run a race team in New Zealand and make a living from it. So um, quickly diversified from that into into this role now, and still managing to live the dream and and do it. But I've got a lot of I've got a lot of good people. My wife handles all the admin. Um, Yamaha are very, very supportive. They really trust in what, what we're trying to achieve. Ben Townley is a big part of the program, which um, which is really helpful. Got a lot of good crew chief uh, in different areas in the road racing aspect. So really, I'm just sort of more so pulling the strings from Yamaha to the teams and making sure Yamaha get the correct investment, but at the same time, making sure our development pathway is open and then making sure our staff in the office are focused on core business around sales. So I'll pro I guess probably subcontractor and fortunate to do all that, which gives me a good outlook on life and work with some really cool people and good family, good good families. And I've said it time and time again tonight, come back to those family values. Um, and and uh, that's what we're looking for in our riders. Um, and, and, and to your parents listening that are focused on your son being good or or daughter and want them to be successful. Um, and I know we're not at the high level. We're not at, we do run a professional program. Our riders are paid, but we're not running at a GP level. So, you know, we are looking for those values, you know, as a brand, that's what, that that is more important to us than the outright speed and results. So um, something you may want to uh, consider. Yes, definitely. You've been really interesting. I really appreciate your time. You're a very busy man, giving us a couple yeah. of hours. Really appreciate it, Josh. It's been really, really interesting. No worries. Thank you. Um, really appreciate it. Hopefully see see all of you at some stage back in the UK. Um, 
around the tracks near Marshfield or in the southwest with my son. Hopefully I get to ride too. Or, But if not, um, watching him ride and having fun at the races with him. And, um, yeah, feel free to come up and have a chat. And, um, yeah, so um, hopefully see you over there sometime soon. All going well. Yep, I'll get down to uh, Tom's motor stream quite a bit now. So hopefully I'll get to catch you down there sometime. It'd be cool. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you very so much, Josh. Really appreciate it, mate. Top man. Thank you, Lee. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Josh. Have a good day. Take it easy. See, Have mate. a good day, buddy. Thanks a lot. Cheers a lot. Thanks. Bye. Awesome. Another legend in the bag on motocross and speedway memories. Mr. Josh Coppins. Really enjoyed that. Very good insight into everything. He's very, um, explains it all very well. Uh, and you can see he's very professional in what he does. Uh, that was very interesting. He went into some very good details there that a lot of us wouldn't have known. Um, yeah, really interesting. <laughs> Ian Chesterman. Josh, such a quality interview. And thanks for keeping me from having to watch the UK soaps with my missus. Thank God for the noise cancelling headphones. <laughs> Top man, Ian. Glad you enjoyed that. Thank you very much, James. Josh, what a top rider he was. Very, un very unlucky not to win that world title that year that he had. I know it was pretty much a 100-point lead at one point uh, in the GP that year that he got injured. Uh, he definitely should have been world champion that year. Uh, no disrespect to Steve Ramon that season, but uh, Josh Coppins was definitely the man that season, and he should have had a world title to his name for sure. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you all guys for all your questions as well. Um, I actually thought I had all my questions done and sorted down in front of me as well, but I actually didn't. <laughs> so yeah, I had to think of my feet that time. So it all went okay. So that's good. Um, yes, exactly that, Steve. Uh, such a nice guy as well, down to earth. To be fair, a lot of these uh, guys we're getting to speak to are great, great uh, guys as well been very enjoyable they share a lot of details with us that a lot of us wouldn't have known or information we would have probably never heard or would have never got to heard so um it's very cool that for sure um just to keep you updated i will keep you all um updated on any interviews that i've been also i've been talking to some, some speedway guys and motocross guys uh, so hopefully i will organize some more i have organized another bsma legends one um already uh, for next Tuesday, 7.30 p.m. UK time with uh, Charlie Hollis, who was definitely a great BSMA rider and one, and one I've got lined up for the BSMA legends. Uh, he now lives in Aussie as well. So I'm sorting that out. He's doing that early morning for us. Thank you very much, Richard, for getting involved. Great insight. Definitely needs to write a book sharing his knowledge and not just about his racing. Yes, for sure, mate. I, th I, th I thought he was very interesting and very detailed in what he says and very uh, thoughtful about what he was saying as well, which was very interesting. Um, so, yeah, I've got that one with um, Charlie Hollis, but for next Tuesday, I've been talking to a lot of guys, as I said, so I will keep you all up to date on uh, what I'm doing next. Um, on the bike competition, um, I've only got about 30 tickets left now on that. In case any of you don't know what the bike competition is, I'm doing the um, that one there. Look. Is it coming up or what? Yeah, there we go. Doing the uh, 250 uh, two-stroke Kawasaki there. It's a Zeb Tortelli JHK Kawasaki replica. There's my ugly mug there as well with the bike. And uh, I've got this for you as well with a quick video you can check out. <laughs>
She's a beauty. Anyone interested in the bike competition, then message me on any of my media. Uh, my number's on my website, mxandspeedwaymemories.co.uk. as uh, my website. You can go on there. There's lots of stuff on there. You can get to my YouTube videos there. There's um, uh, tells you all about what the next one's going to be. The next interview is always a, there's a big countdown clock on the on the front home page of the website as well to the next uh, interview, stuff like that. There's lots on there that you can check out. Uh, we've got my YouTube channel. You can subscribe to that for free. Uh, there's loads of hundreds of uh, interviews on there now with the Speedway legends and motocross legends, even as far back from nine, ten months ago when I first started it out started off with some q and a's and then we went into some recorded skype ones that a lot of people don't even know about so if you ever want to check that out you can always check any of these live interviews that i do they're all recorded i normally share the link to them the following day but you guys can watch them in your own time um it's good to do that around your busy lives i know so you, you can catch them at any time um got my facebook group uh, you can join in with that and you can invite family and friends into there as an invite button um, I've got my competitions page on Facebook as well, but across the sphere of memories competitions. We're on Instagram as well and Twitter. A lot of this live, you can ask questions live from YouTube, Twitter, and the Facebook group and the page and my own, uh, my own one as well. Um, Lee Britton, <laughs> have you rode Speedway? Bit of a long story that one. <laughs> But yes, I did have a go at Speedway, and uh, I did take to it straight away. I was 16 years old. Um, I had a go at Swindon Speedway. There's a bit of a story behind that, but I'll leave that for another day, otherwise I'll go on. <laughs> then I'll bring up my mum and stuff like that, denying my professional Speedway career and stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll leave that for another day. <laughs> Richard, how's it going, Richard? Great insight, and he definitely needs to write a book sharing his knowledge and not just about his racing. Yeah, for sure, mate. <clears throat> it was very interesting. Uh, what else did I want to show you guys? Uh, yep, yeah, so there's all. You can just check that out. Look, it just says about uh, my things. That you can... Um, hopefully I'll have some more information about the uh, reunion meeting that we've got set for the 4th and 5th of September, a two-day meeting, probably looking at a practice day on the first day and then a race meeting on the Sunday. As everyone knows, it's a BSMA reunion, but as people have asked me, yes, it will be open to anybody as well. Um, I will sort of been roughly thinking about groups and things like that. So obviously when we announce uh, where we're going to use where we're going to do this event um there's been a lot of interest in it which is amazing i think that'd be an amazing thing to get the reunion going so we're just going to call it motocross and speedway memories reunion because there will be a lot of speedway guys there as well you can have some speedway memorabilia there stuff like that some stuff like that will all be there i know a lot of speedway riders are going to come and watch and there's some that race motocross before their speedway days that are interested in riding as well so that should be cool uh, so, yeah, there's only about 30 tickets left on the competition. If you want to message me about that, uh, you can do. Um, I will hopefully get more information on the reunion soon when we're trying to sort out a track now. So see how that goes soon. Uh, and then I will get, I will inform you guys, obviously, about the next uh, upcoming interviews as well. Uh, Callum Marshall's asking me about uh, Alan Graham. Obviously, until any of the lockdowns sorted out, Callum, um, Jill won't be able to get Alan Graham over to his brother's house, Andy, to do the live interview. So until that, we've got a finality on that, on the COVID and the lockdown, then uh, we can't get that done at the moment, I'm afraid. So, But Jill definitely said she's going to sort out about Alan trying to come over to Andy's house and sort out that live interview. So that is definitely in the plans. I'll get back to you on that. Uh, right, I'll see you all soon. Have a good rest of your evening. Have a good rest of your week, and I'll keep you all informed on uh, what's coming up next as well. Uh, I'll leave you with my dad's quote, as I always do: that it's uh, nice to be important, but it's important to be nice. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much. Much good night. See you all soon. Ciao, Bella. <laughs>